The following presentation contains serious subject matter, and for apparent reasons, the speakers choose to conceal their identity. Occultism must win the day before the end of the 21st century. The Zohar appeals to many Jews in a way that makes them regard it as the most sacred of sacred books, for it mirrors Judaism as an intensely vital religion of the spirit, more overpoweringly than any other book or code, more even than the Bible, does it give to the Jew the conviction of an inner, unseen spiritual universe an eternal moral order. The influence of the Kabbalah has been great, for it has been one of the most powerful forces ever to affect the inner development of Judaism, both horizontally and in depth. If one turns to the writings of great Kabbalists, one seldom fails to be torn between alternate admiration and disgust. Today, we are standing on the threshold of Earth's history, wherein the final countdown between Satan and Yahweh is reaching the climax. The Bible warns us about the intensity of Satan's fierce one-world Machiavellian plans. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. In this video, you will witness the shameful teachings of the synagogue of Satan, the Kabbalah. I will be presenting the views of the liberal reformed Jews, the Hasidic Orthodox interpretation, and other splintered teachings on the Kabbalah. To make my point about the dangerous teachings of the Kabbalah, I will be quoting largely from authors who are in favor of the Kabbalah, using quotes from the Kabbalah itself and other occult sources. The Dictionary of Mysticism and the Occult defines the word Kabbalah to mean an oral tradition. This is the key of keeping the satanic knowledge secret by passing it on to a tightly knitted filtered circle of initiates orally. I recently was in the occult section of a bookstore. I saw a woman eagerly looking at the books on the Kabbalah. We entered into a discussion. I mentioned that it was not long ago that the Kabbalah was reserved for the Jews. Some Kabbalists impose some restrictions in studying the Kabbalah. They say the initiate has to be at least married. Also, the initiate must be over 40 years of age and trustworthy. Today, many liberal Kabbalists reject these rules. 
I said to her, is it logical to expect the traditional Kabbalists, after so many years of secrecy, to impart this knowledge freely in these books? No one boasts about their studies. No one usually talks about them either. Most students, when asked, will deny that they are even studying this material. This is the right way to be. Modest, concealed, silent, and secret. Even if everybody is studying, no one should be talking. Serious Torah students study Kabbalah and do not advertise it. She thought about it and concluded with me that these books are meant to satisfy the curiosity of the masses while hiding the true teachings of the Kabbalah. I met her on another occasion and showed her some of the teachings of the Kabbalah. She was revolted. She was once one out of many people who panted after the secret knowledge of the Kabbalah. A longing for Kabbalah is abroad in the land. Even people with little connection to Judaism, no knowledge of Hebrew, many of them in fact non-Jews, are seeking initiation into the secret chambers of Jewish esoteric knowledge. When humans hear something is secret, we are driven to know. Naturally, we are curious people. Modern-day Kabbalists, supposedly disseminate the Kabbalistic knowledge to the masses, are deceiving people into believing that they possess the secrets of the Kabbalah. Rabbi David Genzelman, the director of Makar, says, It's not the Kabbalah that I know. People take two years of classes, and I don't think they learn a thing about Judaism. They learn about proactive versus reactive. Rabbi Grunman interprets the Zohar to a roomful of the uninitiated. In that class, he'd read one passage in Aramaic, which none of his students understood. So he told them to shut their eyes and listen to the vibration of the letters. The people who are drawn to this Kabbalistic jargon are not uneducated people. Many of them are idolized by many. Rabbi Shmali Botik thinks Michael Jackson can help rebuild his religion. Lectures he hosted drew as many as 2,000 students. Often, most of them were not Jewish, and often the speakers came from the secular world, including Mikhail Gorbachev, the Latin American soccer star Diego Maradona, Jerry Springer, and Boy George. Shmali says everyone, both Jews and non-Jews, is going to embrace Judaism. Many actors are Kabbalized, according to the Jerusalem Report. Hot on the heels of the first generation of Hollywood Kabbalah groupies, a new batch of showbiz devotees has jumped on the Jewish mysticism bandwagon described in our cover story. The neophytes included Marla Maples, ex-wife of real estate mogul Donald Trump. New York Magazine said the Georgia-born Baptist ex-showgirl, eager to please the man in her life, financier Michael Mueller, attends classes in L.A. A few steps ahead of Maples, Oscar-winning actress Gwyneth Paltrow, singer Lionel Richie, and Michael Jackson. For Maples, the non-star in the crowd, Kabbalah may be a trump card in busting into the movies. I take classes. Me too! I'm addicted to it. What's your favorite? Kabbalah. Rabbi Boutique's candid statement about a Kabbalah will show why it's so popular among the heathen. He unmistakably shows the truth that a Kabbalah is opposed to Christianity. Also, he thinks Judaism equips people better than Christianity to enjoy material success and still be holy in God's eyes, making it ideal in this age of prosperity. The Jewish message is, of course you can have it both ways, Shmali says. We've accommodated ambition. You just have to give money to charity. Jesus says it's more difficult for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven than it is for a camel to pass through an eye of a needle. You'll never find a sentiment like that expressed in a Jewish work. In the 1800s, the Queen occultist Helena Blavatsky wrote about the popularity of the Kabbalah and its attacks upon the church. 
The last quarter of our century is witnessing an extraordinary outbreak of occult studies, and magic dashes once more its powerful waves against the rocks of the church and science, which it is slowly but as surely undermining. Anyone whose natural mysticism impels him to seek for sympathetic contact with other minds, is astonished to find how large a number of persons are not only interested in mysticism generally, but are actually themselves Kabbalists. The river dammed during the Middle Ages has flowed since noiselessly underground, and has now burst up as an irrepressible torrent. Hundreds today study the Kabbalah. At thecabalacenter.com, you can purchase baseball caps, t-shirts, hands-free Kabbalah water bottle carriers, Kabbalah love and astrology candles. The reform movement among the Kabbalists are making it rich off the ignorance of their disciples. The traditional Kabbalists are disgusted with the idea of entertaining non-Jews with the Kabbalah. They believe that Jewish mysticism, however deceptively presented, should not be brought to the Gentiles' attention. Rabbi Ovidiah Yosef was quoted in a widely read Jewish newspaper called the Jewish Press, demanding that every male Jew should embrace the Kabbalah. If not, they will be punished. I believe it is imperative that the Orthodox community re-embrace mystical Judaism, Many Hasidic Rebbes were all adepts of Kabbalah and wrote extensively on the topic. Therefore, anyone who wishes to state any opinions to either discredit the Holy Zohar as being the legitimate teachings of Rabbi Shimon bar Yohai or to disrespect or discredit the Kabbalah in general is to be considered a heretic. Every male Jew must study Kabbalah. Rabbi Ovida Yosef has said in his Yevadai Da'at, It is a true and correct thing that the value of Kabbalah study is very sublime, and great will be the punishment for those who do not study the secrets of Torah. When the neophyte is initiated into the true secrets of Jewish mysticism, he is warned not to divulge the secrets of the Kabbalah. The Hebrews taught, that to divulge after initiation into the rabbinical mysteries, the secret of Kabbalah, was like eating of the fruit of the tree of knowledge. It was punishable by death. With these chilling threats and many rabbinical antics, we can understand why the Kabbalah has an important place in Judaism. Salo Baron was a highly respected professor of Jewish history at Columbia University. In volume 8 of his 18-volume work, a social and religious history of the Jews said the following. The great days of the Kabbalah as a major historic force in the destinies of the Jewish people lay in the future. We can see the Kabbalization of the world and not just the Jews is coming to pass. Let us take a brief historical look at the Kabbalah and then explore some of its teachings. There are different views of the genesis of the Zohar. The standard Jewish encyclopedia mentions some of the divergent opinions. In the work, authorship of the Zohar is scribed to the Tana Simeon ben Yohai, his colleagues and disciples. Some defend its early authorship or at least the antiquity of certain sections. Others regard it as the result of a lengthy development. Others consider it to have been written as late as the end of the 13th century by the Spanish Kabbalist Moses de Leon, while others are of the opinion that Moses de Leon utilized ancient material, adding his own contributions. It seems that the two earliest strata were composed between 1280 and 1285 in Spain, and the third by another Kabbalist who was acquainted with the Zohar proper and attempted to imitate it. From the main body of the work, there emerges the figure of a strong personality, belonging to the Kabbalistic school, reflecting the development of Jewish mysticism in the 13th century. Whether it was written by Simeon ben Yohai in the 2nd century, or by the Spanish Kabbalist Moses de Leon in the 13th century, the point remains that myriads of people are influenced by it. The Kabbalah presents a symbolic explanation of the origin of the universe. 
the relationship of human beings to the Godhead, and an emanationist approach to creation, whereby the infinite light manifests through ten sephirot on the tree of life. The dictionary of mysticism and the occult defines the function of the ten sephirot. The sephiroth represent levels of spiritual reality, both in the cosmos and in people, because the tree, metaphorically, is the body of God, and people are created in his image. The tree is sometimes shown superimposed on the body of Adam Kadmon, the archetypal man. The ten sephiroth in descending order are Kether, Chokma, Bina, Kesed, Jebera, Tifereth, Netzach, Hod, Yesod, and Malkuth. The Kabbalah has spiritual links with Gnosticism and other early mystical cosmologies. Wallace Budge was keeper of Egyptian and Assyrian antiquities at the British Museum a century ago. He admitted to this fact in his book, Amulets and Talismans. The Kabbalah of the Middle Ages represents a mass of beliefs and traditions, which the Hebrews adopted from the Egyptians, Babylonians, and Assyrians, Syrians, Zoroastrians, Gnostics, Greeks, Arabs, and even European peoples. And whilst readily accepting new beliefs and theories, they abandon nothing. In the introduction of the Sansino edition of the Zohar, written by J. Ambelson, he did not hesitate to show the complex nature of the Zohar and its connections to other mystical traditions. From a survey of the whole subject, one is drawn irresistibly to the conclusion that the Zohar, so far from being a homogeneous work, is a compilation of a mass of material drawn from many strata of Jewish and non-Jewish mystical thought and covering numerous centuries. Some scholars find a good deal of background of the Zohar in the religion of the ancient Zoroastrianism, the allegorical type of exegesis of which Philo is the leading exponent, Gnostic theories concerning the relation between the human and the divine, echoes of medieval beliefs regarding astrology, necromancy, magic, and metempsychosis, all these elements jostle one another at random in the pages of the Zohar. We have to admit that a Kabbalah is unique. It's the only religion that embodies all these mystical teachings under one umbrella. Before Gershom Shalom died in 1982, he was professor of Jewish mysticism at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He readily admits to the connection between the Kabbalah and the world of mythology, especially the Gnostic imprint on the earliest Kabbalistic text, the Beher. The great symbols of the Kabbalah certainly spring from the depths of creative and genuinely Jewish religious feeling, but at the same time, they are invariably tinged by the world of mythology. It must be kept in mind that the whole meaning and purpose of those ancient myths and metaphors, whose remainders the editors of the book Bahir, and therefore the whole Kabbalah, inherited from the Gnostics. The author of the Zohar extracted various different teachings of Gnosticism and rebuffs it to his own liking. Gershom Shalom gives us many examples of the parallels between the Zohar and Gnosticism. Having a lot of information still to be covered, I will quote one example. Thus he displays the greatest interest in a group of ideas which owes its very development to the already mentioned Gnostical school the idea of a left emanation, of an ordered hierarchy of the potencies of evil, the realm of Satan, which, like the realm of light, is organized in ten spheres or stages. The ten holy sephiroth have their counterparts in ten unholy or impure ones. The latter, however, are distinguished from the former in that each one has a highly personal character. Each, therefore, has a personal name proper to itself, while the names of the divine Sephiroth merely represent abstract qualities such as wisdom, intelligence, grace, beauty, 
etc. The Universal Jewish Encyclopedia is clear about the Babylonian and Zoroastrian roots of the Kabbalah. Although Palestine was the birthplace of Jewish mysticism, the land where the Kabbalah was conceived and born, it was in Babylonia that it attained its greatest importance. Circumstances favored its development, for in Babylonia there was much discussion among the adherents of the various religions, as a result of which the Jews became familiar with many ideas that later were incorporated in Kabbalah. The fantastic theories of the Zoroastrian religion, a system of ghosts and demons, of angels and devils, of reward and punishment, of an upper and nether world, provided a fertile impulse to Jewish speculative students. Demonology plays an important part in many Kabbalistic works. Kabbalists perform ritual magic with the assistance of imps, which they say have supernatural powers to manipulate nature. Demonology, therefore, occupies an important position in the works of many Kabbalists, for the imps are related to those beings that are generally designated as demons, being endowed with various supernatural powers and with insight into the hidden realms of lower nature and even occasionally into the future and the higher spiritual world. Magic may be practiced with the help of these beings, the Kabbalists meaning white magic in contrast to the black art. Hazard, what have you done? Give us a look to find. Give us a look to find. Take it down. Shut up. Give us a look to find. Give us a look to find. Following the healer in his work, we see that he emulates the God of Genesis by taking part in the creation process. In Jewish philosophy, names are the form given to the substance or object. By asking for the patient's own name and mother's name, the healer is grasping at the patient's very essence. Rather than simply identifying the name with the person, he is delving into the individual's destiny. The name is broken down into letters for their numerical value. Since Hebrew has no numerical system, letters have always been used to number things. The words for number and book both share a common root. The power inherent in such a system is described in the mystical Book of Creation. בשלושים ושתיים נתיבות פליאות חוכמה, חקק השם אדוני צבאות, אלוהי ישראל, אלוהים חיים, וקדוש שמו, הוא ברא את עולמו בשלושה ספרים, בספר וספר וסיפור. Once the healer has broken down the names into letters with numerical values, he can proceed from form to substance. Unexpected new meanings are found for the name, based on its numerical value, and the patient is suddenly linked to entirely new concepts and ideas. This system deconstructs our fundamental, banal understanding of reality. People who delve into this system too often do tend to question and doubt the tangible reality of this world. 
With the name turned into numbers, the healer then picks up a worn old book left in a corner. This book, which has been handed down for generations, is a key tool in the healer's art, yet it is not a medical text. Rather, it is a means of divining, not unlike the conch shells used in the Caribbean or the kola nut in Africa. The prophetic insights it provides lend significance to what was, is and will be, as long as the numerical values are constant and unchanging. This might explain why Jews are so adamant to bury any Torah scroll with even one letter missing. תאמרי שלושה פעמים, אלהה, אלהה, דרבי מאיר, דרבי מאיר, עננה, עננה, אלהה, אלהה, דרבי מאיר, דרבי מאיר, עננה, עננה, אלהה, אלהה, דרבי מאיר, עננה. יהיה לך רפואה בעזר השם. תכבי את זה בבקשה. עשן שעולה, תנשימי. תנשימי את זה לאט לאט בניחותה. שוב. תכבי זאת. Witches and Kabbalists make a distinction between white and black magic. They say one is used for good and the other for evil. Anton Levy, founder of the Church of Satan in San Francisco, California, says that there is no difference. Both white and black magic emanates from a satanic foundation. There is no difference between white and black magic except in the smug hypocrisy, guilt-ridden righteousness, and self-deceit of the white magicians himself. Some demons are described as mischievous but not antagonistic towards God. Many Jewish historians acknowledge this. In the Zohar, it is thought that the spirits of evil men became mazakim after their death. However, there are also good-natured devils who are prepared to help and do favors to men. This is supposed to be particularly true of those demons ruled by Ashmedai, who accept the Torah and are considered Jewish demons. In fact, demons could be both good and evil, and often were merely mischievous. In the main demonology among the Jews preserved its simple character as a popular belief, the demons being regarded as mischievous but not as diabolical or as agencies of a power antagonistic to God. The Zohar teaches that the female demon Lilith had sexual intercourse with Adam when he separated from Eve and then with his descendants. It also teaches that Eve had intercourse with the serpent. Satan, who they call Samael, is also mentioned as having intercourse with demons. The fifth volume of the Encyclopedia Judica and the Zohar documents this grotesque teaching. In contrast, the Zohar, following a Talmudic legend, stresses the origin of the demons in sexual intercourse between humans and demonic powers. They sought to take on the form of a body through association with humans, at first with Adam when he separated from Eve, and then with all his descendants. However, the demons who were created out of such unions also long for this kind of intercourse. The sexual elements in the relationship of man and demons holds a prominent place in the demonology of the Zohar, as well as that of several later Kabbalistic works. Every pollution of semen gives birth to demons. They gather on a particular mountain, near the Mountains of Darkness, where they have sexual intercourse with Samael. Rabbi Yitzhak said that from the time that Cain killed Hevel, Adam separated from his wife. Two female spirits used to come and mate with him, and he bore from them spirits and demons that roam around the world. This need not be difficult to accept, because even when a man is dreaming, female spirits often come seduce him, conceive from him, and eventually give birth. These offspring are called the plagues of mankind, and take only the shape of humans.
Lilith, one of the prominent demonic figures in Kabbalistic mythology, was well known to many ancient mystery religions. Lilith, an irresistible long-haired she-demon of the night, flies through Sumerian, Babylonian, Assyrian, Canaanite, Persian, Hebrew, Arabic, and Teutonic mythology. During the 3rd millennium BC in Sumer, she was at first Lil, a destructive storm or wind spirit. Among the Semites of Mesopotamia, she was Lilith, who later, confabulated with Lael, became Lilith, a night demon who lays hold of men and women who sleep alone, causing erotic dreams and nocturnal orgasm. There is also a Jewish feminist magazine named after the demon Lilith. Let us understand where the Kabbalists adopted the doctrine of the Tree of Life. Is it the Tree of Life in Genesis chapter 2 verse 9 or the Tree of the Pagans which God condemns from the Old Testament? One way to find out is to take a perusal look at scriptures that condemns the worship of trees. Tree and idol worship was adopted by the Israelites from Canaan. The prophets protested against this. Whom are you mocking? At whom do you sneer and stick out your tongue? Are you not a brood of rebels, the offspring of liars? You burn with lust among the oaks and under every spreading tree. And they set for themselves sacred pillars and asherim on every high hill and under every green tree. What is noticeable from these scriptures is that tree worship brings with it a combination of images of the Canaanite goddess, sorcery, rebellion, sacred prostitution, and promiscuity. Asherah. Originally, the idol was worshipped as a symbol of the tree of life, but later perverted to mean the origin of life, and pictured with the male organs of procreation. Such symbols became the objects of worship carried on with all forms of impurity, perversion, and licentiousness by crowds of devotees involved in demonized and obscene orgies. The worship centered in the Canaanite nations and then spread into others. Erwin Goodenough magisterial work, Jewish Symbols in the Greco-Roman Period in Volume 12, proves beyond a doubt that the Sephirotic tree of the Kabbalists was extracted from paganism. The tree, including its branches and fruit, appears in Jewish art most often of all the symbols borrowed from paganism. From earliest times, the tree seems to have had great religious significance in Mesopotamia as a symbol of deity, a vehicle or presence of deity, rather than of a specific god or goddess. It could, accordingly, be used to represent various gods as the giver of the fluid of life, an idea which later took the form of the trees being the mother of Tammuz or Adonis. That is, out of the tree came the deity, or divine force, to which people looked for their personal salvation. The meaning of the tree in Egypt was very similar where often a goddess was represented in a tree pouring out the fluid of life upon the deceased, and where palm branches were carried in religious processions. Early Israel was much attracted by the tree cults of their neighbors. The apocalyptic and mystic ideas of the tree were continued especially in Kabbalistic traditions, where the divine Sephiroth, what we may call the emanations of God's nature, took the form of a tree from which proceed all souls. Jewish scholars who deny this should listen to what their internationally respected Encyclopedia Judica said about Goodenough's work. In Goodenough's basic theories, there is sufficient material in his great work to stimulate investigation into previously neglected aspects of Judaism and into evidence which has been insufficiently examined. There are other respected historians who did not decline to show the correspondence between the Sephirotic tree and its connections to paganism. The Kabbalists who are not ignorant should not deny this fact, but admit with the Jewish Encyclopedia, Volume 12, that the Hebrews joined their neighbors in the polytheistic worship of trees. Trees have been objects of worship in all parts of the world, and the Hebrews were no exception to this. 
This polytheistic religion of tree worship is robbing God of his glory and giving it over to a diabolical pantheon of deities. This is why the Kabbalah has a plentorious secrets. Overall, their religion is pantheistic and not monotheistic. This will be evident as we plunge deeper into the mysteries of the Kabbalah. By prayers, amulets, and incantations, the Hasidim believe they can manipulate the Tetragrammaton to do their bidding. All Jewish healers employ the same principle. Anyone possessing the secret of God's name has the power over life and death. At first this may seem odd. After all, God's name appears hundreds of times in the Torah, but it should not be pronounced. It is said that the common names for God in the Torah are simply codes for his true name, which also appears, but in a more subtle way. Some claim that the entire Torah is actually God's name, which explains why generations of Jews have poured over the ancient texts. Hidden within God's name is the secret of life and death. Can such power really be contained within a single word? In effect, it can, since this word is an object in itself, a tangible and real convergence of sound, text, paper and ink. Even in prayer, God's true name is replaced by Adonai, or my master. In less sacred circumstances, people say Adoshem, a contraction of Adon, or master, and Shem, or name. But even this is often too powerful, and many people simply say Hashem, the name. God's name combines Shem with soul, or neshama, and breath, or neshima. Merely pronouncing the word has the power to grant life to people, animals, and even inanimate objects, as the story of Rabbi Yehuda Lowe of Prague illustrates. By just repeating God's name, he was able to give life to the golem. The story itself is reminiscent of Genesis, where it is God who breathes life into a lump of clay, turning it into Adam. The role of healer is to restore vitality, or metaphorically to breathe life into an inert lump of clay. He does this through rituals that emulate the creation myth and God's own breath of life. He takes of God's own power, manifest in the sacred name, and uses it for healing. Actually, the healer can be regarded as a thief who steals some of the divine essence of life and channels it to his own patient. Practical Kabbalah, or the art of employing the knowledge of the hidden world in order to attain one purpose, is founded upon the mysticism developed in the Sefer Yetzirah the book of creation. According to this work, God created the world by means of letters of the alphabet and particularly those of his name. This was practiced in a similar fashion by the Assyrians, Babylonians, Egyptians, Greeks, and Romans. The chief means of harming or of protecting from harm was the utterance of some word or words invested with the highest magical power, and whoever knew the right word had influence over gods and demons, for they could not resist the command spoken under certain necessary and auspicious conditions. Magic pervaded the religions of Assyrians, Babylonians, Egyptians, Greeks, and Romans, and in a still higher degree, the religions of primitive peoples. Many Israelites rebel against Yahweh when he said to learn not the ways of the heathen. The Kabbalists who claim to have this trump card on the Tetragrammaton is mentioned in the Jewish Encyclopedia as a master of creation. If one learns these combinations and permutations and applies them at the right time and in the right place, one may thus easily make himself master of creation. Fanciful stories in Jewish folklore about Kabbalists magically extracting power from the Tetragrammaton to create a golem is thought to be true. An authority on the Kabbalah lists some examples of these farcical bedtime stories. Once upon a time there was a great rabbi in Prague. His name was Rabbi Judah Lo Ben Bezalel, and he is known in Jewish tradition as the Maharal of Prague, a famous scholar and mystic. He is credited by Jewish popular tradition with the creation of a golem, a creature produced by the magical power of a man and taking on human shape. 
Rabbi Lowe's robot was made of clay and given a sort of life by being infused with the concentrated power of the rabbi's mind. The great human power is, however, nothing but a reflection of God's own creative power. The rabbi finally put a slip of paper into its mouth with the mystic and ineffable name of God written on it. So long as this seal remained in his mouth, the golem was alive. It is the latest embodiment of this magic, which we are privileged to dedicate today. It is then any wonder that man should try to do in his own small way what God did in the beginning. The Talmud tells a little story. Rabbi created a man and sent him to Rabbi Zerah. The rabbi spoke to him, but he did not answer. Whereupon the rabbi said, You must have been made by my colleagues of the academy. Return to your dust. The universe, so the Kabbalists tells us, is built essentially on the prime elements of numbers and letters, because the letters of God's language reflected in human language are nothing but concentrations of his creative energy. Thus, by assembling these elements in all their possible combinations and permutations, the Kabbalist, who contemplates the mysteries of creation, radiates some of this elementary power into the golem. The creation of a golem is then in some way an affirmation of the productive and creative power of man. It repeats the work of creation. The desire to create is common to us all, but there are elements in Judaism which may have made men more daring to contemplate the act of God, creation. The way of the soul, seeking to understand a world of mystery and magic. From it would come an esoteric philosophy, Kabbalah, which virtually up until modern times was one of the motor engines of Judaism. Among the Kabbalists were some who embraced the idea of the creation of an artificial man. The Talmud mentions how the prophet Jeremiah created a golem. It also tells us that the great sage Rava created a golem. But truly righteous as Rava was, he could not create a golem that could speak. For to have created such a being would have made Rava the equal of God. No golem from later legend would have the power of speech. Scattered far from their Jerusalem, Jewish scholars would discuss the story of Rava and his golem for centuries. Could one become so pure and righteous as to create The God of the Kabbalists is reduced to being a Kadi. By saying the right words, he is rushing to assist the mystic. The story of the Golem does not end with what was quoted before. By certain meditative techniques and chanting, the Canaanite mystic is said to create a mental image of a human being and use it for astral travel. There is also evidence that creating a golem was primarily not a physical procedure, but rather a highly advanced meditative technique. By chanting the appropriate letter arrays together with the letters of the tetragrammaton, the initiate could form a very real mental image of a human being, limb by limb. This possibly could be used as an astral body through which one could ascend to the spiritual realms. Rabbi Joshua Trachtenberg made some revealing remarks about the Jews who used these black arts. The sources indicate that Jews were at least acquainted with methods of inducing disease and death, of arousing and killing passion, of forcing people to do their bidding of employing demons for divinatory and other purposes. We find accounts of the magician's power to project his soul to far distant places, there to perform an errand, and then return to his comatose body. The use of divination and magic was strictly forbidden to Israel. 
Yahweh's condemnation of these black hearts is expressed in Leviticus chapter 19 verse 26 and Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 9 to 14. The origin of what is known as the Star of David was a recent addition to the Jewish religion. Gershom Shalom traces its Jewish clone theology back to the middle of the 19th century. Until the middle of the 19th century, no scholar or Kabbalist got the idea of trying to detect in the star anything like the secret of its Jewish meaning. It does not appear at all in books on the religious life, nor in the entire literature of Hasidism. And this was the case not because such meaning was assumed and not considered problematical, but rather because no one even dreamt of such meaning. The six-pointed star or hexagram became the insignia of Zionism. The star was mentioned and condemned by the God of Israel in Amos chapter 5 verse 26 and it was called by him the star of your God Malik or otherwise called Kiun. Reference to Amos chapter 5 verse 26 and the Israelites having it in the wilderness was also made in Acts chapter 7 verse 43. Here it was called the star of Remphan. All these names refer to the God Saturn. The foregoing verifies that it was therefore in existence long before the time of Solomon. He took this symbol upon himself when he went into idolatry, and it became known as the Seal of Solomon in Arabic magic and witchcraft. The six-pointed star is as old as the Assyrian and Phoenician religion. Assyrian and later also Phoenician and Hebrew seals often display a six-pointed star with six rays beaming forth from its center. The hexagram is also a Hindu tantric symbol, which represents the sexual connection between the god Shiva and Shakti. The Kabbalists adopted this Indo-Canaanite teaching and remodeled it to mean Yahweh's lustful relationship to the Shekinah. Remember, this is not the Yahweh of the Old Testament. It is the Kabbalist, synchristic God of Canaan. The real history of the hexagram began with Tantric Hinduism, where it represented union of the sexes. The downward pointing triangle was the female primordial image or Yoni Yantra existing before the universe. In the course of infinite time, the goddess conceived a spark of life within her triangle, the Bindu, which was eventually born and developed into a male, symbolized by the upward pointing triangle. He united with his mother to form the primal androgyny. The sign of this union was the hexagram. The downward pointing triangle is a female symbol corresponding to the yoni. It is called Shakti. The upward pointing triangle is the male, the lingam, and is called the fire. From the tantric image of the sexual hexagram arose a Jewish system of sex worship connected with the medieval Kabbalah and a rabbinical tradition that a picture is supposed to be placed in the Ark of the Covenant alongside of the tables of the laws which shows a man and a woman in intimate embrace in the form of a hexagram. As we continue, you will see the Kabbalah is saturated with occult sexual imagery. The Jewish Encyclopedia admits that the hexagram or the Star of David is equally reverenced in Hinduism. Watch any documentary on Hinduism and oftentimes you would see the hexagram. This symbol is very important in witchcraft and the New Age movement. Christ taught that the secrets of the synagogue of Satan would be exposed in the last days. Christ was a threat to the synagogue of Satan because he revealed many of their occult practices. In part one of this series, we zeroed in on the origins of the Kabbalah, demonology, and the Star of David. In this volume, we will delve deeper into the mysterious and perverse teachings of the Zohar. Before I pursued my research on the Kabbalah, I was already familiar with the occult, but when I single out the Zohar for research, 
I quickly recognize that this is Satan's creme de la creme of the occult. Perhaps you too will notice this fascinating revelation. The whole dualistic system of good and evil powers, which goes back to Zoroastrianism and ultimately to Old Chaldea, can be traced through Gnosticism, having influenced the cosmology of the ancient Kabbalah before it reached the medieval one. So is the conception underlying the Kabbalistic tree, of the right side being the source of light and purity, and the left the source of darkness and impurity. Luria clearly took a significant step beyond the intellectual world of the Zohar, in that he found the starting point of evil not in one or another point in the Sephirotic structure, but in the very act of God's self-contraction within his own being. The evil inclination never leaves man from the day of his birth. The good inclination comes to man only when he seeks purity, and when does man seek purity? On his thirteenth birthday, man joins with the good inclination on the right and the evil inclination of the left. They are literally two appointed angels found constantly with man. The Old and New Testament told us much regarding the nature of Yahweh. He is presented as holy, merciful, just, and good. Evil cannot be found in Him. The Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto His name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. Yahweh also promises to create within us a mind to do what is right. This is not the case with the gods of the Kabbalah and the occult world. They embrace a satanic dualism where God is both good and evil. Many people find this hard to digest. So to make it palatable, the occultist gives the nebulous explanation for the existence of evil. People of this serpentine religion say the purpose of evil is to reveal his goodness. Light would be incomprehensible without darkness to make it manifest by contrast. Good would be no good without evil to show the priceless nature of the boon, and so personal virtue could claim no merit unless it had passed through the furnace of temptation. Eliphas Levy in his occult classic The History of Magic accentuates this diabolical dualism in a stealthy way. Seeing that, according to the most exalted interpretation of the great hermetic dogma, hell is the equilibrating reason of heaven, for harmony results from the analogy of contraries. Satan is the author of this poisonous dualism, 
It was entwined in a sermon of enlightenment in Genesis chapter 3 verse 4 to 7 and its enduring lie is preserved in the Zohar, the king of all mystery religions. In fact, there can be no true worship except it issue forth from darkness, and no true good except it proceed from evil. Hence, the perfection of all things is attained when good and evil are first of all commingled, and then become all good, for there is no good so perfect as that which issues out of evil. And the Lord formed the man with both good and evil inclination. Observe, he said, that the Holy One, blessed be He, made a right and a left for the ruling of the world. The one is called good, the other evil, and He made man to be a combination of the two. The principles of Marxism are also found in the Kabbalah. Rabbi Harry Watton draws an interesting parallel between the Kabbalah and Karl Marx's blueprint for communism. No idea is more productive of a deeper insight into existence than the idea of dialectics. The law of dialectics postulates that all conducts in time turns into its opposite. The Kabbalah expresses this thought as follows. There is no light but that which comes out from darkness, for when this side of darkness is subordinated, then ascends the Holy One in the high and is glorified, and there is no work of the Holy One but from darkness, and there is no good but from evil. How can we explain in history why individualism must give way to collectivism, and how competition can bring out cooperation? The possibility thereof, nay, the inevitability of this dialectic movement, constitutes the essence of the Marxian philosophy. How can we hope to understand this process without the law of dialectics? Marx borrowed the notion of an historical dialectic from Hegel's and applied this concept to history from his point of view. There are also many parallels in Hegel's lecture on the philosophy of religion with the Luranic Kabbalah. Like the Kabbalists, Hegel understands the Absolute as evolving through the distinct phases, which ultimately results in the creation of the world and man. Indeed, Hegel's description of at least the early stages of divine evolution closely echoes the views of the Theosophical Kabbalah. In his lectures on the philosophy of religion, Hegel recognizes a moment in the history of the deity in which it is completely unknown. Hegel tells that this idea is prominent in the history of religious speculation, noting that Philo, a Jewish Platonist, defines God as the Ovi, as what has being, in other words, the hidden God who is unknowable, uncommunicative, inconceivable. Hegel informs us that this moment in divine evolution is also spoken of as the Eternal One whose dwelling is in the inexpressible heights and who is exalted above all contact. If Hegel's first moment or definition of God is very similar to the Kabbalist's first sephira, Keter, or Ayin, his second definition echoes the Kabbalist's second sephira, Hakma. To justify the Kabbalist view of theodicy, the Zohar presents evil as an innocuous instrument of God to cleanse sinners. Evil is there simply in order to increase man's chances. Because God wanted man to be free, he ordained the real existence of evil, that he might prove his moral strength in overcoming it. It is the desire of the Holy One, blessed be He, that men should serve Him continually and walk in the path of truth, so that He might reward them with many good things. Now since this is the desire of the Holy One, blessed be He, how can the wicked servant come and object to his master's desire and persuade men to take an evil path and force them away from the good path and make them disobedient to their Lord? But he is actually doing the will of his master. In his attempt to persuade man to break the commandments, the evil inclination is acting as an agent of God. 
From the last quote, it would appear that Satan plays a very important part in our redemption. Here is another example of Lucifer's creation of the Zohar to attack the God of the Bible. The Bible says, God is not responsible for man's temptations. Temptation originates with the devil. The choice is ours, whether we give allegiance to him or Yahweh. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. You decide whether the God of the Kabbalah is similar in nature to Lucifer. The theory of evolution accords with the series of Kabbalah better than any other theory. Evolution follows a path of ascent and thus provides the world with a basis for optimism. How can one despair, seeing that everything evolves and ascends? When we penetrate the inner nature of evolution, we find divinity illuminated in perfect clarity. Einsoff generates, actualizes potential infinity. The concept of evolution did not originate with Charles Darwin. It has been the essential ingredient of all pagan religions and philosophies from time immemorial. For example, Ottomism, Pantheism, Stoicism, Gnosticism, and all other humanistic and polytheistic systems, all beliefs which assume the ultimacy of the space-time-matter-universe presupposing that the universe has existed from eternity, are fundamentally evolutionary systems. The cosmos, with its innate laws and forces, is the only ultimate reality. From this perspective, it becomes obvious that most of the great world religions, Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism, Hinduism, Animism, are based on evolution. This is attested to in two books which have left an indelible mark upon the occult. It will be an easy task to show that the cosmogonical legends all over the world are based on a knowledge by the ancients of those sciences which have allied themselves in our days in support of the doctrine of evolution, and that further research may demonstrate that those ancients were far better acquainted with the fact of evolution itself, embracing both its physical and spiritual aspects, than we are now. The occultists of the ancient world had a most remarkable understanding of the principle of evolution. They recognized all life as being in various stages of becoming. They believed that grains of sand were in the process of becoming human. The ancients maintained that the universe was a great living organism, not unlike the human body, and that every phase and function of the universe body had a correspondence in man. This New Age Babylonian religion is taught in our schools under the guise of evolution. Millennia before Charles Darwin, people in shamanic cultures were convinced that humans and animals were related. Judging from the material that we have, the Babylonians seem to have believed in a kind of evolution, for they evidently regarded the first creative powers, the watery waste and the abyss, as the rude and barbaric beginnings of things, the divine powers produced from these first principles. 
When the West brought Darwin's pseudo-beliefs to India, it gave credence to their worship of the monkey god Hanuman. In gratitude for this important finding, so unexpectedly confirming their ancient legend, they very nearly promote philologists to the rank of the gods. Darwin climaxed this whole subject. With the spread of Western education and scientific literature in India, the people became more than ever convinced that we are the descendants of their henumen, monkey god. Once that science, in the person of Darwin, supports the wisdom of the Aryans, there is nothing left for us to do but to submit. And, surely, it is better to have Hanuman, the poet, the hero and the god, for a forefather, than some other monkey. According to Hindu cosmology, the origin of all things was a vast expanding centrifugal force or explosion, which today we call the Big Bang. The principle of this explosion that gives birth to the world is called Shiva. The Big Bang theory of modern scientists is strikingly similar to the way some Jewish mystics describe the creation. For if the Big Bang theory is accurate, scientists may be confirming the creation myths of the Jewish and Hindu mystics. Just as science has confirmed the ideas behind Jewish and Hindu creation myths, so it has lent credibility to other statements Jewish mystics have made about the universe. While the groundwork was laid to persuade people that evolution was a science, the world of the occult was being hardened in their myths. Added to the equation of evolution was the notion that if we had evolved from matter to human, then the last stage is from human to being a god. Once this lie had gained acceptance, the time was ripe for Lucifer's genesis of lies. You shall evolve and be as gods. Everybody from Jesus Christ to Adolf Hitler would be seen as someone who we can identify with because we are all one. I think that certainly there is every potential for all of us as spiritual beings to merge as one. We've mastered the evolution of the physical body. We've mastered the evolution of the mind, or we're moving in that direction. So we're coming to a time where we're using this perfected, quasi-perfected body, this opening and, and perfecting mind, to access the true perfection of the universe, which is the spiritual dimension. And that's, I think, our purpose on Earth, and I think we're understanding that, is to make ourselves whole, to become one with ourselves, and then to realize our godhood. And I believe that everyone has Christ consciousness within themselves, and all they need to do is go inside and realize that, and bring it forward, and be that Christ consciousness. This, the evolution of man into Superman, was always the purpose of the ancient mysteries. Man, who has sprung from the earth and developed through the lower kingdoms of nature to his present rational state, has yet to complete his evolution by becoming a godlike being and unifying his conscience with the omniscient. While natural selection does not adequately describe the inner development of humans, especially since it has been interpreted materially, yet evolution is not just a scientific theory of the development of life forms, but a great cosmic principle describing the development of consciousness. Many researchers now espouse the ageless wisdom teaching that consciousness precedes matter, and that the material universe is the outer, dense expression of divine consciousness, the outer embodiment of a divine idea. Darwin was a pawn in the game of Satan to erode people's confidence in the Bible. All the previous religions we have mentioned that have similarities with the theory of evolution also have parallel beliefs with the Kabbalah. This is why the liberal Kabbalists romanticize evolution in their publications. Our civilization has been transformed over the past century and a half in no small part by our acceptance of a new tale of origins, one that began with Darwin and is refined daily by the work of life scientists and physicists. 
Scientists are the new Kabbalists of our age, claiming even to know the black hole out of which being itself came to be, speculating on the first few seconds of existence, as our ancestors once did on the highest triad of the ten sephirot, or rungs, of divine being. The New Age Kabbalists fell for Satan's first lie. The following quotes will show how they apotheosized themselves. God places himself for display upon earth in the likeness of the Jew. The Hebrew is the living God, the God become flesh, the heavenly man, the Adam Kadmon. The soul of a Jew is truly a part of God above. Not only do the New Age Kabbalists claim that they can become gods, Rabbi Yehuda in the Zohar says that in the near future, they will have power to create worlds and raise the dead. In the name of the Rav, Rabbi Yehuda said that in the future, the righteous will create worlds and raise the dead. In the latter part of the 13th century, Rabbi Abraham Abulafia was one of the most important mystical teachers in the history of Kabbalah. He was not universally accepted because he decided to disseminate the knowledge of the Kabbalah in his numerous writings. The few who had kept this knowledge strictly for the adepts were not pleased with this. Abulafia spent a great portion of his life practicing and teaching ecstatic vision a Judaized form of yoga, and gematria. Abulafia lays down certain rules of body posture, certain corresponding combinations of consonants and vowels, and certain forms of recitation, and in particular some passages of his book, The Light of the Intellect, gives the impression of a Judaized treatise of yoga. The similarity even extends to some aspects of the doctrine of aesthetic vision as preceded and brought about by these practices. From the earliest times up until today, many Jews have gravitated towards syncretism, incorporating many pagan practices into their religion. This syncretism began with the rebellion against the teachings of Moses and the prophets up until the time of Christ. Spiritually bankrupt, some of them seek spiritual fulfillment through yoga. Apparently, Diana is far from alone in her quest to blend her yoga and Jewish practices. Jewish yoga hybrids have sprouted up everywhere, from a Miami synagogue that offers a yoga breath and Jewish prayer workshop to a Rosh Kadesh woman's yoga group that meets in Manhattan. A television producer in Manhattan, Jody Williams, who considers herself a spiritual and cultural Jew, has practiced yoga regularly for the past three years. Hasn't Judaism survived against all odds precisely because it has remained flexible enough to adapt to the needs of its followers? In their quest for Canaanite enlightenment, many Jews around the world, already interested in the Kabbalah, are fascinated with Hinduism, Buddhism, and Tai Chi. Jews crop up ubiquitously around Dharamasala in meditation and yoga courses, Reiki workshops, Tai Chi sessions, and Buddhist lectures. Many Jews and Israelis come to seek answers in the great spiritual bazaar of India. Hindu Fakir Sai Baba in Shirdi draws many with his religious universalism, as does the commune of the late Guru Osho in Pune. But most Jewish seekers make pilgrimage to Dharmasala. 
Buddhism is hot, and Tibetan Tantra Buddhism is even hotter. It's esoteric and mystical, exotic and colorful. This past Yom Kippur, he, Aitin Turkel, a religious Jew enrolled in Yeshiva in India, trotted down the hill from Dharamakot to listen to the Dalai Lama in a public audience at his monastery in Dharamasala. Then he legged it back up to the Jewish service at the local Chabad outpost. I feel I can take a lot from Buddhism and use it in my Judaism without becoming a Buddhist. This last sentence from Ethan Turkel is worth repeating. I feel I can take a lot from Buddhism and use it in my Judaism without becoming a Buddhist. When I read this, I asked myself this question. What is it about Judaism that retains many Jews while they practice other religions? The answer is that many branches of Judaism teach that Jews are superior to other nations. This is why they will have no problem borrowing the beliefs of other nations, creating a hybrid Judaism. National ambition, however, rather than eclecticism, influenced the Jews, and though it was impossible, having regard to their environment, that they should not be tinctured largely, it was their object to tinge other systems, and not to modify their own, to shew that the ethnic philosophers owed everything to the divine doctrine of Palestine. It is precisely the existence of this transitional stage which alone accounts for all the phenomena we are studying, a stage in which there was real Jewish syncretism, but which was succeeded by one of assimilation of pagan ideas and forms into Judaism itself, while pagan names and mythology were finally rejected. A clone form of Kabbalistic yoga today is called Ophanim in which you twist your body into the shape of Hebrew letters. There are those who say that the mysteries of the universe can be unlocked with a practice of yoga called Ophanim, in which you twist your body into the shapes of Hebrew letters, based on a theory of Jewish mysticism that claims the universe was created when God spoke the Hebrew alphabet, Ophanic, which his practitioners translate as angels of form, is built on the idea that each letter is a conduit for divine energy and has a corresponding yoga posture. By practicing these postures, the theory goes, you can connect with the letters associated physical and emotional strengths. Mr. Kolos, who had a bar mitzvah but grew up without much of a religious background, said Ophanim has helped him return to his faith. He is able to read Hebrew again and is connecting with the essence of Judaism, he said. The two other students of Ophanim I spoke with concurred. It's been part of my whole reawakening, said Rand Marsh. I do Hatha yoga and Tibetan yoga, and the Hebrew letter yoga is the most powerful yoga form I've done. Cindy Watchker, who has studied yoga before, but has only begun taking Ophanim with Mr. Kolos, said she was attracted to it because of the Jewish content. While on the subject of yoga, it should be noted as well that many Christian spiritualists deny the outward appearance of yoga, yet their teachings and experiences are similar to Kundalini yoga. Throughout the world today, there are many so-called evangelists who are claiming that they have these supernatural powers in which uh, they're able to transfer these new gifts. Uh, people will laugh and shake, twitch, fall over, jump up and down like they're on pogo sticks, some laughing hysterically, some even behaving like animals. And these people claim that they are bartenders of the Holy Spirit. They're able to give this anointing away. Now the question is, is this biblical? Where in the scriptures do we find that in the last days people will laugh hysterically in the church? Where do we find that people will behave like animals, roar like lions, bark like dogs, crow like roosters, and that this would be a sign that this is of the Spirit of God? I do not find this anywhere in the scriptures at all. And this is why I am deeply troubled and concerned regarding what is taking place in the church. I believe that many people are being convinced that they are receiving the Holy Spirit when it's not the Holy Spirit and they're actually being deceived and they're opening the door for a delusion which was preparing the way for the Antichrist. 
Although there are many people today in the world embracing these strange kinds of behavior, uh, the shaking, the twitching, uh, the jumping up and down like they're on pogo sticks, or this uh, unusual laughing, hysterical laughing, or even animal behavior, claiming that this is something new, that this is from God, I find no basis for this kind of behavior as something that is given to us by the Holy Spirit. It's not found in the Bible. But we can find in the literature a description of this kind of behavior as something which comes from what's called the serpent power, the kundalini. Uh, for example, I have in my hand here a book called The Stormy Search for Self by Groff and Groff, psychotherapists. And on page 78 and 79, they describe what happens to people who are overcome by the serpent power. Quote, individuals involved in this process, that is the kundalini, might find it difficult to control their behavior. During powerful rushes of kundalini energy, they often emit various involuntary sounds and their bodies move in strange and unexpected patterns. Among the most common manifestations of this kind are unmotivated and unnatural laughter or crying, talking in tongues, singing previously unknown songs and spiritual chants, assuming yogic postures and gestures, and imitating a variety of animal sounds and movements. So here in a book which describes occultic behavior, we find all of the symptoms of what we're seeing today in the church where people are claiming this is a gift from God. I don't find any basis in the Word of God for this kind of behavior, but I do find a basis in the literature describing occultic. Rajneesh says his goal is to create a new man, one who is happily mindless. <laughs> this is the first time we've had a full manifestation of that anointing. We got there.
This is called dynamic meditation. This violent frenzy continues on and on, creating a mind-altering form of hyperventilation. Wild movement alternates with periods of utter stillness. Can't copy it. <laughs> I didn't ask for this. No, I, I didn't. The problem was when I came through the doors in November '94, and the Lord said to me, What do you want, John? I said, I want to get drunk. but I forgot to tell him for how long. <laughs> mm. Now, I don't mind being drunk. It's great. But I said to the Lord, Lord, I don't like looking drunk. You know, your eyes get bloodshot. And... and he said to me, John, you see, some of you think God doesn't talk like that, but he's very, he's a fun God. Let's get the fun back into church. And he said, John, you see the rock stars when they're on the TV the next morning being interviewed on breakfast TV? Do you notice they always wear sunglasses? So he said, Get yourself a pair of sunglasses. <laughs> I call these glasses glory shades. No. I'm sure Moses would have wore them if they had sunglasses in the Old Testament. Now, hang in, please. This is a moment when many Americans have become disenchanted with the demands of organized religion and more interested in a spirituality that asks less of their time and allows for a direct relationship with God. The fastest growing faiths are the most exotic and spiritual. The popularity of evangelical churches exploded. Membership in Pentecostal Christianity grew by 400% in the Southern Baptist churches by 54%. There are sociologists who say America is in the middle of its fourth great awakening. A 1997 Newsweek poll found that 54% of Americans pray every day. But many are disenfranchised from an organized church and see religion not as an inherited given, but rather as the old pick and choose Chinese menu. The promise keepers and the vineyard, for example, mix Christianity with self-help. Many Christians are into Eastern religions. I included in my treatise on the Kabbalah 
counterfeit Christianity because there is an organized attempt by proponents of the New Age to neutralize the teachings of Christ by injecting Eastern mysticism. A leaderless but powerful network is working to bring about radical change in the United States. This network is the Aquarian Conspiracy. In the Old Testament, many Israelites lost their battle with Eastern mysticism. Still wanting to be Yahweh's chosen people, they blended Eastern mysticism with the teachings of the Torah. The metamorphosis of this is the Kabbalah. You have abandoned your people, the house of Jacob. They are full of superstitions from the East. They practice divination like the Philistines and clasp hands with pagans. serious subject matter and for apparent reasons the speakers choose to conceal their identity The doctrine of transmigration of the soul, on which the Kabbalah lays great stress, in order that the soul may return to its source, it must previously have reached full development of all its perfections in terrestrial life, 
If it has not fulfilled this condition in the course of one life, it must begin all over again in another body, continuing until it has completed its task. For so we have learnt, that at the hour of a man's departure from the world, his father and his relatives gather around him, and he sees them and recognizes them, and likewise all with whom he associated in this world, and they accompany his soul to the place where it is to abide. We are spiritual beings who have chosen to reincarnate lifetime after lifetime in human bodies, yet the essence of who we actually are in an energy being called a soul, and as such we have embarked on a very long and sometimes very difficult journey through many lifetimes in the physical world. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Ever since Adam and Eve gave heed to Satan's first great deception, the immortality of the soul has become the cornerstone of apostasy and paganism. The Egyptians built an elaborate system of tombs and pyramids to preserve the body as well as possible for the return of the soul. Oriental religions such as Hinduism proclaim the transmigration of the soul, teaching that death is but a door to a new form of life, higher or lower, depending on how good a life one leads now. But it was the Greeks, under the fertile genus of Pythagoras, Socrates, and Plato, who give a systematic form to the doctrine of the immortality of the soul. There are few religions which are not infected by this teaching. Some Kabbalists falsely claim that Moses learned this teaching from the Egyptians, and it was passed on orally to the adepts of Israel. Others say it was hatched in Babylon. Makers of occult speculations, who remember that Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, conceive it to be impossible that he should have known nothing of doctrines which were known to all Egypt, and they hold accordingly that he communicated them secretly to a circle of initiation, by which they were perpetuated in the oral way others inclined to the notions that they were acquired by the Jews in Babylon. In one way or another, it was inevitable that the Jews should have acquired it, which they did accordingly. The truth of the matter is that the Kabbalists adopted their belief of immortal soulism from Egypt and Babylon. Moses was included to make the serpentine religion kosher. To the Jewish mystic, that is seen as an inner development, the evolution of the soul. In the Kabbalistic view, dying is indeed seen as an important stage of inner development. Rather than regarding this process as the finale to human existence, the Kabbalah depicts it as merely one stage in the evolution of the soul. That we are immortal beings is a fundamental principle for Jewish mystics. Their entire system is based on it. However, what gives the act of dying its significance is that through it, we very much determine our next phase of being. But better than both of them is he who has not yet been, who has not seen the evil work that is done under the sun. Ecclesiastes refers to he who has not returned to his youth and been reincarnated. He is a thoroughly righteous person who does not need a new incarnation to achieve perfection, and is not burdened by former sins, like one incarnated who suffers for sins he committed in former life. The Holy One, blessed be He, prepared for Him a fitting place in the world to come. Come and behold, it is written, And so I saw the wicked buried, and come to their rest. 
as we said, that they were born again to mend their deeds. For the Holy One, blessed be He, is kind and does not want the world to perish, but prefers to reform the wicked through reincarnation. Rabbi Yosef, the spiritual leader of the Shas Party in Israel, said in a radio broadcast that the Nazi murderers were reincarnated souls of Jews who sinned in the past. This offended many people, but many rabbis defended Rabbi Yosef's statement in the Canadian Jewish News. In Radio Remarks broadcast in Israel, Rabbi Yosef, spiritual leader of the Shah's party, said victims of Nazi murderers were reincarnated souls of Jews who sinned in the past. Rabbi Shoket, who serves as head of Toronto's Va'ad Harabonim, the Council of Orthodox Rabbis, said the theology behind Rabbi Yosef's remarks was sensitive and complex. Essentially, those who died in the Holocaust were pure people, holy people, without sin, but, he continued, they must have been a reincarnation of people who had sinned at some time. Rabbi Martin Bernman of Shar Shalom Synagogue, a conservative congregation in Thornhill, said people have misunderstood what Rabbi Yosef was trying to say. In Kabbalistic tradition, there is the notion that people may have sinned and not gained full atonement. So to get divine mercy, they suffer punishment to enter the world to come, having atoned for their sins. According to Hindu and Buddhist belief, reincarnation is necessary to reach Nirvana. The Zohar speaks the same language with little variance. He is a thoroughly righteous person who does not need a incarnation to achieve perfection and is not burdened by former sins, like one incarnated who suffers for sins he committed in former life. The Holy One, blessed be He, prepared for him a fitting place in the world to come. We have further learnt that at the time of a man's death he is allowed to see his relatives and companions from the other world. If he is virtuous, they all rejoice before him and give him greeting, but if not, then he is recognized only by the sinners who every day are thrust down into Gehenna. After death, the various parts of the soul, having accomplished their mission, return to their original location, but those which have sinned are brought to court and are purified in the fiery stream of Gehenna, or, in the case of most shameful sinners, burned. The Lurianic Kabbalah added to metempsychosis proper the theory of the impregnation of souls, that is, if two souls do not feel equal to their tasks, God unites both in one body, so that they may support and complete each other. You know, I met with the Dalai Lama a couple of years ago, and these kind of discussions took place, and I found myself thinking, what he is saying and what my teachers taught me is not altogether different. It's true, he doesn't use the word God, I do. But what do you describe a system which talks about life continuing as a conscious entity between lifetimes? Isn't that spiritual? Isn't that mystical? Isn't this subject to theistic thinking? And it occurs to me that certainly that's all possible. The fact that there is a notion of natural law, like karma in one tradition, and to me that's a religious law referring to God, but the process is identical. So I really think that there may be a lot said in terms of, yeah, it's just a different choice, a different axiom. I attribute it to a creator. He doesn't. I don't understand what that means when he says he doesn't. But on the other hand, the process is the same. On the one hand, in the Buddhist tradition, this life is the experience of the unenlightenment, of a neutral state. 
foundation of all karmas and traces of samsara and nirvana. It stores negative emotions and actions caused through past behavior. Life circumstances and situations are like seeds that germinate from the earth of the past. The life is like a bank <clears throat> in which karma is deposited. And the negative behavior entrenches the karma. The state of karma determines our life, our death, rebirth. And then all beings with similar karma have common visions of the world. Each one of us, however, has an individual karma in a uniquely personal way. Aren't there faint echoes of what we spoke about in the first half of this presentation? And isn't it again remarkably similar? Because in our tradition, life affords us the opportunity to realize states of enlightenment and complete the agenda of the individual soul's descent. It allows us to exercise choice. Every moment of life is an opportunity to help the souls sojourn. All people who belong to the same soul grouping will tend to gravitate towards each other and face common and intertwined obstacles and challenges. Each soul essence is, however, unique with its own tests. So the idea of, for example, commonality of souls in both traditions, although it's not Sorry. the word soul does, isn't used in the East, this Eastern tradition, but nevertheless the entity is spoken of in the same context. You know, in our tradition, for example, Hasidim, who gather around a particular Rebbe, are viewed as soul sparks of the master soul. And the reasons why we're inexorably drawn to say a Rebbe is because we belong to that same soul grouping. Likewise, in family settings, and the interrelationship between the sparks of soul and the soul continues throughout lifetimes. You may be born as the child, whereas in the earlier lifetime you were the mother. You may have been the husband in one and wife in the other. And onwards and onwards, although it doesn't have to be like that. But very often these things recur in family groupings, friendship groupings, to complete unfinished business. Not a very different con concept than we have found in the East. Janassen Gushem's book, Jewish Tales of Reincarnation, relates a Hasidic story surrounding Rabbi Schnur Zalman. On one occasion, when Rabbi Zalman was teaching his Hasidim, a previous disciple of his who died appeared to him asking him for his advice on what judgment he should choose. The options he had from the heavenly court were to spend half an hour in Gehenna, which is the Jewish equivalent of purgatory, or reincarnate back to earth. Here is the event as it is recorded. I have also included a quote from the Zohar. Rabbi Shnur Zalman was sitting at the table as usual, learning Torah with his Hasidim. Then the soul of Reb Noah appeared to him in the spirit and posed the question, Earth or Gehenna? The Rebbe turned to his Hasidim and said, Reb Noah is here right now, and he is asking what judgment he should choose, a half hour in hell, or to be reborn in this world a second time. Rabbi Shnur Zalman put his hand on his forehead, then rested his elbow on the table and concentrated very deeply. For a long, long time he just sat there in silence, turning the question over in his mind, weighing all the consequences. Then came the answer, Gehenna to purgatory. As soon as the Rebbe had said the word Gehenna, the Hasidim all heard a voice cry out, Oi, Rebbe! At the same moment they saw burned into the wall by the door the outline of a human hand. It had been made by Reb Noah's soul as it entered Gehenna. Rabbi Yehuda said, Happy are the righteous when the Holy One, blessed be He, wishes to take back their spirits to Himself and suck their spirits from within them. For we have learned that when the Holy One, blessed be He, desires to recall the spirit, if it be a righteous spirit, it is written, and the spirit returns to Elohim who gave it. 
if it is not found to be righteous woe to that spirit which must bathe in the burning fire and be purified in order to be sucked into the body of the king namely the holy one blessed be he if it is not corrected woe to that spirit once it is buried numerous executioners grab it until it reaches duma and it is put in the stories of gehenna in the zohar when a woman marries the brother of her deceased husband her dead husband takes human form by incarnating into the body of his brother thus the institution of the leveret is explained by the theory of transmigration if the dead man's brother marries his widow he draws back the soul of the deceased husband he builds it up again and it becomes a new spirit in a new body so far we see the hebrew canaanites and those who follow them are establishing the religion of the serpent which the bible condemns the next quote clearly shows the source of the kabbalist necromantic knowledge when righteous people go on a journey and occupy themselves in the study of the torah they are visited by righteous souls from that other world who reveal to them new explanations of the torah so this surely must be the reason why rabbi hamnuna saba came to us from that world to reveal these teachings to us and before we were able to recognize who he was he went off and disappeared there are some similarities between catholicism and kabbalah purgatory is one and having someone intercede for the dead beyond the grave is another for instance catholics believe mary to be their intercessor and pray to her instead of going directly to jesus the zohar is in concurrence with this teaching the only difference is that they communicate to the deceased patriarchs and their spouses to supplicate to god to relieve them from their distress the zohar states that god does not show mercy until he consults the patriarchs for so we have learnt that when a virtuous man is left in the world he is known both among the living and the dead and when the world is in great distress and he cannot deliver it he makes the trouble known to the dead said rabbi judah little do men know how god extends his mercy to them at all times and seasons three times a day a spirit enters the cave of machpelah and breathes on the graves of the patriarchs bringing them healing and strength then the patriarchs awake they and their spouses and supplicate on behalf of their descendants then the soul tells the spirit and the spirit tells the higher soul and the higher soul tells god we have learnt that god does not show mercy to the world till he has informed the patriarchs and for their sakes the world is blessed <laughs> והחיים הולכים ומודיעים לנפשות הצדיקים ובוכים על קבריהם. אז מתעוררים נפשות הצדיקים ומתאספים והולכים ופורחים לישני חברון ומודיעים להם הצער. כשאנחנו עולים על קבר של צדיק, וכאן אנחנו יודעים שמיטת הצדיקים מחפרת. כשאנחנו הולכים לקבר של צדיק, מתאספים ומודיעים לנפשות צדיקים את הצרות שיש לנו, כל אחד בפרטיות. ולכל היהודים בכלל, לעולם בכלל, כל הצרות, אז הנפשות של הצדיקים מתעוררות, האנרגיה הזאת, כן, הנפשות של הצדיקים מתעוררת, ומתאספים ביחד והולכים ופורחים לישני חברון, למערת המכפלה. והם מודיעים להם לאבות שלנו, אברהם, יצחק ויעקב, מודיעים את הצער שיש לנו, כן? וכולם נכנסים בפתח ההוא ומודיעים לרוח, ואלו הרוחות... המכתרים בגן עדן, מלאכי עליון, הולכים ומודיעים לנשמה, נפש של הצדיקים, הרוח, ואחר כך הנשמה, והנשמה מודיעה לקדוש ברוך הוא ממש את הצרות שלנו. וכולם מבקשים רחמים על החיים, והקדוש ברוך הוא מרחם על הארץ בשבילם, בשבילותינו. וזה שאמר שלמה המלך עליו השלום, לשבח אני את המתים. רבי יונתן בן עוזיאל זה תן הקדוש שהיה לפני כמה אלפי שנים אחד מגדולי התנאים בגליל והרבה אנשים פוקדים את המקום במשך השנה הרבה אלפים כל הזמן, המקום מאוד ידוע 
הוא כל כיוון הצדיקים בסגולה לתפילה, אבל במקום הזה באופן מיוחד גם בעניינים שנושעים, בעניינים של זיווג וילדים וצאצאים. לכן הרבה אנשים, הרבה מעם ישראל פוקדים את המקום הזה. זאת אומרת, אדם רואה שהוא בא, אומר קצת תהילים, מתפלל, מבקש, זכות של המקום, זכות של המקום, זכות של הצדיק, שהיה צדיק יסוד עולם. כמו הילה, תפילות עולות, יש שמיים, לפעמים שערים נפתחים. יותר מסוגל במקומות של צדיקים, התפילה. This diabolical practice is condemned in the Bible. The Israelites were warned not to participate in necromancy. The Bible condemns it because it is an avenue where demons can possess the dabbler. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. In the May 20, 2002 issue of the Jerusalem Report, in the book review section of the magazine, I saw an interesting book put out by two prominent Jerusalem psychiatrists who have worked for 20 years in the Community Mental Health Center at Herzog Hospital. The book is entitled Sanity and Sanctity, Mental Health Work Among the Ultra-Orthodox in Jerusalem. The authors said unambiguously of their Kabbalist patients that their belief in life after death promotes psychosis. It seems that our patients had unresolved grief responses, which were reactivated by the Kabbalic message that the souls of the dead not only live on, but can be repaired by our intervention. In this way, an interest in Kabbalah may precipitate or aggravate psychosis. Here are two examples of people driven to madness after studying Kabbalah. First, the case of Benjamin. It was only after several clinic visits that Benjamin felt he could entrust us with details of his secret life. He and a friend had started studying Kabbalah together, apart from the group, reading the Zohar, the Book of Visions, and the Book of Transmigrations. From the moment he saw the apparitions, demons started to pursue Benjamin day and night. They told him to kill people and then commit suicide, threatening him, We will strike you with madness. You will inherit hell twice over. At this time, he was again preoccupied with the death of his friend in the army and used magical practices to call up his spirit. In an attempt to shake off the demons, he removed all the books on mysticism from his apartment, left the yeshiva and went to live with his parents and took a job as a security guard. On one occasion, when they were taunting him after a day's work, he shot at the wall in his parents' home in an attempt to get the demons to let him be. In the two weeks before his referral, he became very depressed and suicidal, suffering anorexia and insomnia. Here is another episode with another patient called Ezra. Ezra was very distressed when his wife gave birth to a daughter. He began to hear a voice which he identified after reading some books on Kabbalah as that of a personal angel. The angel ordered Ezra to chastise himself by frequent fasting, abstaining from sexual relations, and wearing tattered old clothes. Ezra added that he summoned his angel by lighting eight candles aligned in a specific geometric form and reading from the book of Raziel. In the preparation for the trance, he would fast and isolate himself. Then he would use rhythmic body movement and a repetitive melody to induce the trance and an incantation formula to summon the angel. Many New Age practitioners also dabble in these black arts. It is taught in the Kabbalah that an unclean person will transmigrate into the body of an unclean animal, reptile, or be invested with a body of a Gentile who will eventually become a proselyte. It is also needful that thou shouldest know that the Kabbalists believe in metempsychosis from the body of one species into the body of another species. 
Thou hast already been informed of the mystery of clean and unclean animals, and some of the later sages of the Kabbalah say that the soul of an unclean person will transmigrate into an unclean animal, or into abominable creeping things or reptiles. For one form of uncleanness the soul will be invested with the body of a Gentile, who will become a proselyte. For others it transmigrates into an ass, a woman of Ashdod, a bat, a rabbit or a hare, a she-mule or a camel. Ishmael transmigrated first into the she-ass of Balaam, and subsequently into the ass of Rabbi Pinchas ben Yer. There is little variance between Kabbalism, Hinduism, Buddhism, and the Western mystery religions on this subject. The differences are hardly noticeable. Many Indo-Hebrew Canaanites fly from Israel to India to seek enlightenment. They come to the realization that the Kabbalah is a spin-off from these religions, so many return to the Kabbalah, because it has one ingredient that the other mystery religions lack, racial superiority. They did not inherit this doctrine from the Gentile mystery religions. Their originality lies within this teaching. Aiton Turkel recites from the Shema, and his attentive listeners clamor in amazement. It's just like the fourth Buddhist precept of right speech. It's even the same wording the Buddha would use, exclaims Lobsang, a young monk from Tibet. It's because of such overlaps that some Jews come to India in search of Buddhism and instead find Judaism. Zohar David, the 30-year-old Chabad emissary in Dharamakot, came very close once to becoming a Buddha devotee himself. Just out of the army in 1991, David, then a secular Israeli from Yemenite stock, landed in India, searching for meaning. His quest took him to a Tibetan monastery in Nepal, and soon, he says, he was well on his way to taking the novice monk's vow. Then a fellow Israeli gave him a copy of the mystical book, the Zohar, and it set him thinking. The Buddhists talk about reincarnation, and so do we. He says in the garden he shares with Reiki practitioners, Then I wondered, there must be a reason I was born a Jew. The Kabbalah explains that before reincarnation, souls choose the best bodily vessels for spiritual growth, and so souls become Jewish for a purpose, he adds. Satan's ye shall not surely die has crept into many Christian churches. Many unsuspecting ministers learn it at seminary, preach it on the pulpits, and at funerals. Dear widow, your husband who is in heaven continues to love you as he did on earth. Today he loves you with a fonder, sweeter, purer love. There is no more a break in love than there is in continuity of thought. How could this widow's husband continually love her, while the Bible says, For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Also their love, and their hatred, and their envy is now perished. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. What we learn from this scripture passage is that the dead know not anything. They have no love, hatred, or wisdom. All these human qualities perish at death. The opposite of this is what Satan said in the Garden of Eden, Ye shall not surely die, which is echoed in the Moody magazine and many other Christian publications. This we are certain. Believers go directly into the presence of Christ at death. They are conscious and in command of all their faculties. As D. L. Moody said before he died, soon you will read in the papers that Moody is dead. Don't believe it, for in that moment I will be more alive than I have ever been. So much is different, yet you are quite the same. You have entered heaven without a break in consciousness. Back on earth your friends will bury your body, but they cannot bury you. Death does not change what we know. Our personality will go on with the same information we have stored in our mind today. Let us briefly look at what the Bible teaches about death. If the dead go to heaven or hell at death, 
then there is no need for a resurrection. But the Bible teaches us about a future resurrection, one unto life and the other for the wicked unto death. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice, and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. After the righteous are resurrected, there is a thousand year span before the wicked are resurrected to be destroyed. Revelation chapter 20 verse 4 to 9 talks about this. We are referred to in the Bible as mortals. Immortality is given to us at the resurrection and not before. That is why the Apostle Paul encourages us to continue to do good so that we have the right to seek immortality in the future. He would never say to seek immortality if we already possess it. To them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality eternal life. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. The Bible also tells us that Christ is immortal which in his times he shall shew who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality. Since Christ alone has immortality, for us to say that our soul is immortal is to knowingly or unknowingly say we are gods, which is in line with Satan's first occult sermon. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods. The property possessed by the serpent of casting its skin and apparently renewing its youth made it an emblem of eternity and immortality. They may regard virtue as better than vice, but God being removed from his position of sovereignty, they place their dependence upon human power, which without God is worthless. The unaided human will has no real power to resist and overcome evil. The defenses of the soul are broken down. Man has no barrier against sin. When once the restraints of God's word and his spirit are rejected, we know not to what depths one may sink. I have seen the results of these fanciful views of God in apostasy, spiritualism, and free loveism. The free love tendency of these teachings was so concealed that at first it was difficult to make plain its real character. Until the Lord presented it to me, I knew not what to call it, but I was instructed to call it unholy spiritual love. Rabbi Simeon began by quoting, Abram went on his journeys from the south as far as Bethel, to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai. He went on his journeys. Scripture should have said, his journey. But we have two journeys here. One refers to Abram, and one to the Shekinah. For with every man male and female should exist together, in order that faith may be strengthened, Strength is given to the Sephirotic system, especially to the Shekinah, 
because human intercourse assists the process of celestial intercourse. When he returns to his home, he should give his wife great joy by having intercourse with her, because it was his wife who enables him to have celestial union. Sexuality lies at the heart of all the ancient mystery traditions, but in past generations this fact was seldom openly admitted. Usually it passed over in silence, or hinted at with poetic imagery. Again and again in ancient texts you will encounter the statement that information is being deliberately omitted, and those who wish to know those forbidden matters must learn them by oral teaching from an initiated master of the tradition. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence. It wasn't long after creation that Satan introduced the Canaanite philosophy that a man and a woman can entice gods and goddesses to lewdly unite. This is called imitative magic. The prophets protested against this and many other strands of Canaanite mythology which Israel borrowed from the surrounding nations. Under the influence of Canaanite mythology, many Israelites had come to see the processes of nature as the result of the relations between gods and goddesses. Divine intercourse would lead to abundant harvests and an increase of cattle. Cultic prostitution, performed by humans, was a form of imitative magic by which the gods could be moved to engage in similar activities with all the ensuing beneficial results. Human beings stimulate the divine union. Human marriage symbolizes and actualizes divine marriage, while the evening of Sabbath turns into a weekly celebration of the cosmic wedding and the ideal time for human lovers to unite. The prophets rail against Yahweh's rivals among the Canaanite fertility gods and goddesses, which proves that the Israelites engaged in such forbidden worship. But she reemerges as Shekinah in Kabbalah. The two major proponents of this ancient religion are Jewish mysticism and Hinduism. The Shekinah of the Zohar is the same as the Hindu goddess Shakti. This is readily noticeable to anyone familiar with the Zohar and Hinduism. The adepts and disciples of Tantric Hinduism invoke their god and goddess to possess them before participating in sexual immorality. The central and defining aspect of Tantra is the act of sexual union which may involve either a mortal woman who serves as the vessel for the goddess Shakti, a mortal man who serves as a vessel for the god Shiva, or disembodied spiritual entities that fulfill either role. The male practitioner invokes the god Shiva into himself and seeks union with Shakti through sex with his female partner or sex with his spiritual partner. The female practitioner unites with Shakti by invoking the goddess into her own body then finds union with Shiva in her male consort or a spirit lover. The woman herself was regarded merely as an instrument by Hindu adepts. Prostitutes trained in Tantra were favored because of their knowledge of sex and their freedom from false modesty. Adepts also employed their wives in this role, but the use of a prostitute had the advantage of creating an emotional detachment between the adept and the woman chosen as the living vessel of Shakti. Charlotte Allen wrote a recent article on Wicca in the Atlantic Monthly, where she provides an inside look at the ritual practices of the ancient and present shamans and priestess rites of imitative magic. The religion's earliest adherents worshipped two deities, one of each sex, the mother goddess, the birth giver, who brings into existence all life, and the horned god, a male hunter who died and was resurrected each year. Male shamans, dressed in skins and horns in identification with the gods and the herds, but priestesses presided naked embodying the fertility of the goddess, all over prehistoric Europe, 
people made images of the goddess, sometimes showing her giving birth to the divine child, her consort, son, and seed. The reemergence of this indo canaanite nature religion is engulfing the world according to the same article. Another pagan conception in refined form passed into the Kabbalah through the Talmud was a so-called mystery of sex. The Gnostic theory of Syzygies was adopted by the Talmud and later developed into a system by the Kabbalah. The Gnostic writing of Tremorphic Potenua found at Nagamadi, the Gnostic feminine revealer cries. I am androgynous, I am both mother and father, since I copulate with myself. I copulate with myself and with those who love me, and it is through me alone that the all stands firm. I am the womb that gives shape to the all by giving birth to the light that shines in splendor. I am the aeon to come. I am the fulfillment of the all, that is, the glory of the mother. The teachings of the Zohar are identical to the sex rites of the pagans. First, let us consider the words of a reputable scholar on the Kabbalah to get a clear understanding of the Kabbalist view on the mystery of sex. As David Bayel has shown, early Kabbalists such as the author of the 13th century manuscript, Igrayet Ha Kodesh, took a generally positive attitude toward human sexual relations, providing instruction on such topics as sexual technique, foreplay, and the timing and position of sexual intercourse. What is unique amongst the Kabbalists, and especially the author of the Zohar, is the view that those couples who engage in proper and meaningful sexual relations on earth not only become holy themselves, but actually assist the divine powers to come together in sexual union on high. The fruit of this central religion is seen in a famous 16th century Kabbalist, Isaac Luria. Isaac Luria himself had intercourse with his wife every night of the week just after midnight, as a prophylaxis against nocturnal emissions. Isaac Luria left an indelible mark on the Kabbalah. Most Kabbalists acknowledge him as being a saint. According to the Zohar, the Shekinah dispenses blessings on the Kabbalists when he is having intercourse. Thou shalt visit thy house and not sin by performing with gladness the religious duty of conjugal intercourse in the presence of the Shekinah, which gives joy to the Shekinah. Esoterically speaking, the supernal mother is found in company with the male only at the time when the house is prepared and the male and female are joined. Similarly, the lower mother is not found in company with the male save when the house is prepared and the male visits the female, and they join together. Then the lower mother pours forth blessings for them. Psalms chapter 37 verse 25 is a faith-enriching scripture that shows David's reflection on his personal experience, emphasizing the providence of Yahweh on those who follow him. I have been young, and now am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Here is the Zohar's interpretation of this scripture. Now the righteous one holds fast to the upper world, and also to the lower world. As for the words, nor his seed begging bread, the meaning is that when the seed flows forward, he does not court the female, since she abides with him and never parts from him, and hence is ever in a state of readiness for him. For the seed does not flow save when the female is present, and their mutual desires are blended into one indissoluble ecstasy. Rabbi Simeon rejoined, as regards the seed it is, since it is written, his seed, but not he himself, that is, the outpouring of the blessings only occurs when there is close union of the female with the male. The sewage of the Zohar runs through the same pipeline as the Kama Sutra. Although the Kama Sutra is grossistic and straightforward, the Zohar is worse in the following sense. The Zohar perverts God's word 
to sanitize its insane Canaanite imagery. The Zohar, on occasion, describes in graphic detail the female genitals of the divine persona over and against the male organ. Indeed, in one striking passage, the vagina, which corresponds to the Shekinah, is described as the place to conceal that penis that is called mercy. Sexual intercourse is a reverse counterpart to circumcision in the latter the element of the penis that is revealed is the female corona, whereas in the former the penis is concealed by the female genitals. The visible aspect of the Shekinah is linked to the sign of the covenant. Owen Goodenough, a historian highly esteemed by Jewish scholars, verifies and expands upon what we just read. The Zohar goes on to describe human intercourse as a direct rite by which one shares in the metaphysical unity of the aspects of divinity. A man, the Zohar explains, should be complete, that is, be like God, in being always both male and female. One normally accomplishes this by being married and having regular intercourse with one's wife, but when a man leaves home, as for example a student who must go to a strange city to study at a scholarly academy, this male-female completeness is broken. So he must pray God to send the Shekinah to him. The Shekinah is female, and she can be granted to live with a man so that he can unite himself with her while he is away from his wife. When he returns... He must at once have intercourse with his wife, since it was she who procured him this heavenly partner. The Kabbalah Shekinah is somewhat like an adulterous prostitute. She is one minute's God's wife, and in the next, engaging in sexual relations with someone else's husband, while he is on a journey. This reminds me of the myths of the Ugaritic text dealing with the pagan god Anat and her consort Baal. The predominant view among scholars is that the Ugaritic texts present Anat as the fertility goddess, who is the consort of the god Baal. Some scholars further allege that the texts present her as acting like a prostitute, either to entice Baal specifically or in her general conduct. Even when she is described in what seems to be more respectful terms as Baal's sacred bride, this carries overtones of illegitimate sexuality because it implies cultic enactments of the so-called sacred marriage, which is also referred to by many scholars as ritual prostitution. The Zohar mentioned a story about Moses, saying that while he was on earth, he had intercourse with the Shekinah. A highly respected professor of Jewish mysticism translated the following from the Zohar. Moses, the man of God, of him and of him alone it is said, in a striking phrase, that he had intercourse with the Shekinah. From certain passages in the Midrash, where mention is made of the termination of Moses' sexual relationship with his wife, after he had vouchsafed personal intercourse with God, from face to face, Moses de Leon has drawn the conclusion that for him, the marriage with the Shekinah had taken the place of earthly marriage. In Rabbi Berg's translation, although he tiptoes around the embarrassing teachings of the Zohar, could not help but translate the fact that Moses put away his wife to have sexual relations with the Shekinah. Michael the angel said before the Holy One, you have instructed Moses to separate from his wife, since remove your shoes from off your feet means that he should separate from his wife as the scripture uses a subtle language. The Holy One, blessed be he, told him, Moses has already met his requirement of being fruitful and multiplying. Now I wish that he should marry the Shekinah, and the Shekinah will descend to reside with him. The day that the Shekinah came down is the day that she was married to Moses. When the Shekinah returned from the exile in Egypt, Moshe was able to mate with the Shekinah. When I checked the Sonsino edition of the Zohar for this reference, it was not translated. 
Here's their retarded excuse for not doing this. Here in the text follows a passage dealing with the prophetic grades of Moses and Jacob as typified respectively by the Jubilee and the Shemitah. It has been omitted from the translation as being highly technical and in the nature of a digression. Here is one of many examples of the deceptive Kabbalists filtering the Sewer of the Zohar to the English readers. This was done to hide the perverted mind of the Kabbalists. According to the Zohar, Moses was not the first husband to the Shekinah, it was Jacob. When Moses died, the Shekinah returned to Jacob. Yaakov was the first husband of the queen, but after Yaakov died, the feminine principle mated with Moshe. As long as Moshe was enclosed in a body in this world, he visited her, as was proper. The Shekinah entered the Holy Land after Moshe had died, and she returned to her first husband, who was Yaakov. The goddess of the ancients were portrayed as being evil, benevolent, protectors, erotic, and symbols of fertility. The goddess Kalima was, and still is, highly revered in the mythology of the ancient and modern nomenclature. The ancients addressed their goddess images with a reverence entirely equal to, if not stronger than, that expressed by God worshippers. Here is the reverential description in the Indian scriptures of the great crone goddess Kalima. Thou art the original of all the manifestations. Thou art the birthplace of even the gods. Thou knowest the whole world, yet none know thee. Thou art both subtle and gross, manifested and veiled, formless yet with form. Who can understand thee? Thou art the supreme primordial Kalika, resuming after dissolution, thine own form, dark and formless, thou alone remainest as one ineffable and inconceivable, thou thyself without a beginning, multiform by the power of Maya. Thou art the beginning of all, creatix, protectress, and destructress. What is milk like? Oh, you say, it is something white. You cannot think of the milk without the whiteness, and again, you cannot think of the whiteness without the milk. Thus, one cannot think of Brahman without Sakti, or of Sakti without Brahman. One cannot think of the Absolute without the Relative, or of the Relative without the Absolute. The primordial power is ever at play. She is creating, preserving, and destroying in play, as it were. This power is called Kali. Kali is verily Brahman, and Brahman is verily Kali. It is one and the same reality. When we think of it as inactive, that is to say, not engaged in the acts of creation, preservation, and destruction, then we call it Brahman. But when it engages in these activities, then we call it Kali or Sakti. The reality is one and the same. The difference is in name and form. The reason why the goddess Kalima and the god Brahman are meshed in one is because of the androgynous role they play in Hindu mysticism. This ugly black goddess Kalima is known as the goddess of death. Tantric worshippers of the great Hindu crone goddess Kalima saw her as an ugly ferocious ghoul as well as a loving mother and a beautiful mystic Shakti, but they said her hideous death aspect was most essential to enlightened comprehension of her. The sage's knowledge of his goddess is incomplete if he does not know her as his terror and devourer. The flip side of this goddess is Shakti, the goddess of love. Kali and Shakti, the goddess of love and war, are the same as the Old Testament Astaroth, Astarte, or Ishtar which God condemned. Astarte, the more motherly the consort of the high god El, is a goddess of both love and war. Ishtar presents two very distinct aspects. On the one hand, she is the goddess of love and procreation. On the other hand, she was also the goddess of war. This goddess of love and war re-emerged in the Zohar as the Shekinah. Notice the similarities to what we saw about the goddess Kali, Shakti, 
Ishtar and Astarte in the following quote in the first volume of the Zohar. I kill and make alive. That is to say, through the Sephiroth on the right side I make alive, and through the Sephiroth on the left side I kill. But if the central column does not concur, sentence cannot be passed, since they form a court of three. Sometimes, even when they all three agree to condemn, there comes the right hand which is outstretched to receive those that repent. This is the Tetragrammaton, and it is also the Shekinah, which is called right hand, from the side of the Hesed kindness. When man repents, his hand saves him from punishment. But when the cause which is above all causes condemns, then there is none that delivers from my hands. I kill with my Shekinah him who is guilty. From the previous quote, you can see the goddess of love and war is identical with the Shekinah of the Zohar. Reverence for the goddess is becoming more prevalent in our day. Witchcraft, feminism, the occult, and the liberal church embrace this goddess. The new age that is about to dawn upon us will be, according to the occult world, a feminine age. Likewise, those who hold this view believe that this current masculine age has been an age of destruction and broken relationships among humanity. The new age, with its feminine energies, will bring balance to the destructive aspects of the Piscean age. Wicca, sometimes known as the goddess movement, goddess spirituality or the craft, appears to be the fastest growing religion in America. Thirty years ago, only a handful of Wiccans existed. One scholar has estimated that there are now more than 200,000 adherents of Wicca and related neo-pagan faiths in the United States, the country where neo-paganism, like many formal religions, is most flourishing. Pagans tend to be white, middle class, highly educated and politically involved in liberal and environmental causes. About a third of them are men. Wiccan services have been held on at least 15 U.S. military bases and ships. To invoke the goddess is to awaken the goddess within, to become that aspect we invoke. An invocation channels power through a visualized image of divinity. We are already one with the goddess. She has been with us from the beginning, so fulfillment becomes a matter of self-awareness. For woman, the goddess is the symbol of the inmost self. She awakens the mind and spirit and emotions. The Bible warns us that these dumb idols are merely a front allowing the unwary to be possessed by devils. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. The author of the book, Lilith, writes about an incident involving one of her colleagues who was overtaken by an evil spirit while writing a book on the goddess. A woman colleague told me that when she began writing about her goddess, she was filled with sexual desire and had to lie down on the floor of her office and masturbate before she could continue her opus. Uh, again, to our, get, to our audience and to our video friends, this is uh, Larry Thomas, a great author, a man that has served in the, in, the, in the charismatic circles, the Pentecostal circles for years as a devoted minister, a great writer. Uh, tremendous materials, uh, now a bit sick, but recovering. Uh, Larry, tell us, where will this end? I, uh, I used to think I couldn't be shocked anymore, Brother Joe, but I'm, I'm, I'm beyond that, I guess, now. Uh, a radio interviewer asked me one time when we were first discussing the Toronto phenomenon, and uh, he said, where will it go? And I, I, I said this for shock value. I said, if things continue with the fleshly emphasis to sensual worship, I said, we'll see temple prostitutes in Pentecostal churches. Uh, I got the reaction I wanted from the listening audience, but uh, that was almost two years ago, but we have seen videos of people in, in Pentecostal churches, primarily in England, but uh, simulating sex acts around the altars. Wait a minute now. You've seen pictures. Yes. Of people um, simulating sex acts simulating, around the altar. We have um, a report from a very reliable friend who's, very active in uh, an apologetics ministry in Europe, 
that uh, there's a pastor's wife who has holy orgasms at her ser- at the services on a Sunday on a regular basis. Uh, it, it's it's just beyond. Larry, you're shocking me. Well, I was shocked when I heard it, and I I've been very hesitant to say too much about it publicly until I talked to the man who's been. He's seen the videos. He's visited the church. Um, it's it's just. Is it's, this brother Jacob? Yes. Okay. Oh, he is a he is an extremely reliable. One of, I mean, he was he was high in the in the Pentecostal circles prior to his having to leave because of the delusion. And here is a man now that that's overwhelming. It is, and like I said, I, I I'm almost fearful to predict what might uh, what might come in another six months or year. It's just we have totally uh, desensitized ourselves to the true move of God's Spirit to His Word, and. Um, I know these things seem almost incredible for your listeners to to comprehend, but it, it will get worse. Well, you know, when we hear about the Earl Park Church in Atlanta, Georgia, Earl Park Jr., Right. Uh, see, his dad was my state overseer at one time. He was a protege and a friend of mine in, in earlier days in the, in the denominational church of, uh, of Pentecost. Uh, and now his church and many of his staff people himself has been, made, uh, been found guilty time after time, or at least accused time after time, of having uh, affairs with women in the church and saying that God told them to do it, that they had reached a spiritual level, that they could involve themselves in the women of the church, not their wives, in, 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 uh, in, in sex acts and it not, you know, be any problem, any sin. Right. Now, that's already happening in numbers of places right here in America. Yes, it is. And uh, what, what amazes me is that these men who at one time may have been right on in their understanding of God's Word can be so deceived that they believe God is really telling them that committing sin is all right for them. It, it's really a tragedy. But uh, I've, you look at men like Earl Falk and others who have had some pretty spurious uh, doctrines about kingdom now and and a lot of uh, new revelation type thing what invariably i've found over the last 15 years or so is that false doctrine invariably leads to immorality yes we have become slack in the area of holiness the clergy in general is experiencing an alarming increase in sexual misconduct activities recently two major denominational leaders were charged with gross sexual misconduct A bishop was indicted for sexual misconduct. The conduct included the dismemberment of the parishioner. A Pentecostal bishop, whose sexual escapades were well known and were generally accepted, was overlooked until his appetites moved from adult mothers to their underage daughters. We have holier-than-thou attitudes. We think I'm so holy, nothing I do can be wrong. For example, women in white uniforms, called nurses, but having no nursing licenses accompanying the preacher into the bathroom to change clothes, all his clothes. The preacher justifies the practice by suggesting that he is so under the anointing that he can hardly change his clothes alone. Here is another example to show that we are living in a world where spiritual decay is omnipresent. The author of the book Myths and Mysteries of Same-Sex Love gives us an inside look into a sexual encounter with the god Dionysus. Dionysus is the Greek god of wine, fertility, and revelry, who was worshipped in frenzied orgies, the most famous of which was held at Athens in the spring. We had each taken a psychedelic drug as part of a ritual celebration of my move into my present home. I felt myself approached by Dionysus and made love to him. I was only dimly aware of my human lover's presence some feet away as priestess and witness. I did not touch myself, and my companion never came close enough to touch me, but I felt myself touched by a lover who knew me utterly, who touched every surface with a delicate and absolute assurance, who made me entirely alive, who opened me up as I have never been until then. All that happened seemed to happen between the god and myself, but my lover was present, the only person I can imagine being present who would not have made such an experience impossible, and the only one who would have known immediately what was transpiring. Later the evening we too made love, and some weeks later I discovered I was pregnant. As soon as I realized that, it seemed clear to me 
that the child belonged to the God and was to be ritually sacrificed to him. I feared that might mean having to arrange for an abortion. Instead, I aborted spontaneously on the morning of the summer solstice, Dionysus's birthday. It felt as though the God himself had come to take the child away. Miriam Harris wrote about her neurotic experience with a serpent in a pagan feminist magazine called The Beltane Papers, a journal of women's mysteries. Last night I dreamed a serpent entered my body through my vagina and crawled out through my mouth. My entire body, every organ, every cell, responded. I'm not sure if I was asleep or awake. I only remember feeling possessed by a tingling sensation and raptured. My body opens and spreads out to accommodate the form of the snake. I lie helpless. My arms and legs stretch stiffly out in V's. The snake passes through my body, moving, touching, licking, awakening, pulsating. Every cell tenses and holds itself tense against the ever-encompassing sensuality. I close my eyes in deep ecstasy as the snake slithers out against the roof of my mouth and works its way back down my body. My skin glistens inside and out. I am wet with a sense of wonder. My eyes open as the snake re-enters my vagina. I teach myself to relax as its form begins once again to expand inside me. Occultists call this abominable act sexual alchemy, having intercourse with spirit beings. Another morbid practice that accommodates this insane experience is ingesting semen and menstrual blood. These practices are believed to enchant psychic abilities, prolong sensual pleasure, and elevate consciousness. Sexual alchemy is a system of ritual magic that allows its practitioners to initiate and sustain satisfying erotic relationships with loving spirits who are the active agents of the goddess. Love-making with these spirits releases large amounts of occult energy into the body that concentrates itself in the three fluids most closely associated with the pleasures of sex and the generation of new life. The clear, lubricating fluids released from both male and female genitals during arousal, the red menstrual blood of women, and the white semen of men. By collecting these transmuted secretions, preparing them properly, and regularly ingesting them in minute amounts, catalytic changes can be brought about in the mind and body that intensify and prolong sensual pleasure, enhance physical and psychic abilities, and elevate the level of consciousness. Islam is the religion that condemns idol worship, and they claim to be a monotheistic religion. The Kaaba, a shrine in Mecca that previously housed 360 gods, was the epicenter of pagan worship in Arabia. Allah, the moon god, was the chief of the 360 gods worship in Arabia at the time of Muhammad. Every mosque has a symbol of Allah, a moon and a crescent. When prayers are initiated, Muslims bow down, facing the Kaaba in Mecca. What is left of the 360 deities in the Kaaba is described in three authoritative books on paganism. Not surprisingly, given this male-oriented and dominated religious system, the sacred black stone that is the major feature and attraction of the great mosque at Mecca is regarded the hand of Allah, the monotheistic and jealous male deity. What is surprising is the fact that the major object of veneration is a meteorite, a stone fallen from heaven, fitted in a silver band with the shape of a woman's genitals. The precisely the shape of a mandoral, shaping it into a symbolic representation of the Jagad Yoni. Evidence from ethnology, linguistics, astronomy, mythography, and comparative religion makes it clear that the Yoni stone and the place of the sacred shrine had once been in the hands of pre-Islamic pagan priestesses who worshipped their goddess Alat with her manifestations of al Uza, al Minat and cure at this site. Many are the myths and legends that demonstrate the change from a matrifocal religion and society to the present-day patriarchal systems. 
In all fairness, Muhammad's teachings on sexuality were perhaps suitable as an improvement on the very primitive and aggressive culture that dominated Arabia. It is curious that the Kaaba, the cube-shaped building in the great mosque of Mecca, contains a black stone or meteorite that was once worshipped as a symbol of exalted femininity. The ancient Meccans worshipped mother goddesses in the form of stones, which were ritually circumambulated as the Kaaba of Mecca is today. The pre-Islamic pantheon is made up of names and images of pious men and a triad of goddesses, Alat, Al-Uzza, and Manat, who ruled throughout Arabia. The feminine principle is repeatedly emphasized in Islamic symbolism. For example, Friday, which is sacred to the planet Venus, is the Muslim's holy day, green is the color of the prophet, and being the symbolic of verdure is inevitably associated with the world mother, and both the Islamic crescent and the shmitar may be interpreted to signify the crescent shape of either the moon or Venus. The famous stone of Kabar, Kaaba, Kabir, or Kabir at Mecca, says Jennings, which is so devoutly kissed by the faithful, is a talisman. It is said that the figure of Venus is seen to this day engraved upon it with a crescent. This very Kaaba itself was at first an idolatrous temple, where the Arabians worshipped Al-Uzza, God, and Isa, that is Venus. Whether knowingly or unknowingly, Muslims are paying homage to the goddess. The twin religion of goddess worship is the Canaanite serpentine religion, where the snake is coiled up as a symbol of sexual energy, wisdom, and fertility. The serpent generally symbolizes sexual energy, and wisdom, the two are linked. It is written that the goddess's true firstborn took the form of the divine serpent, the phallic serpent represented sexual knowing. When men made images of the mother, they often showed her accompanied by her snake, or even gave her a snake form. Yahweh condemned Israel many times for imitating the sexual rites of the Canaanites. We should take note of the inroads of a Canaanite sexual rite into Israel in which young virgins offered themselves to the divinity and expected fertility in return. They surrendered themselves to strangers inside the holy precincts. The phrase, a whoring away from Yahweh, calls to mind, in addition to the bridal rites of initiation discussed above, a profusion of Canaanite fertility cults in whose theology the land appears in the form of a mother goddess. Yahweh allowed Israel's apostasy to be meticulously recorded as an example for us today. Now all these things happened unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Now these things were our examples, to the intent we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Unveiling Freud's theories exposes lust, incest, and, for a woman, penis envy. And Freud was convinced that all of these are psychologically determined by age five or six. Through the element of Greek drama, Freud has convinced the world that every child is filled with a desire for incest and homicide, every child desires sexual intercourse with the parents of the opposite sex, every child unconsciously wants the like-sex parent to die, and every child is confronted with castration anxiety. Probably no single individual has had a more profound effect on twentieth-century thought than Sigmund Freud. His work has influenced psychiatry, anthropology, social work, penology, 
and education and provided a seemingly limitless source of material for novelists and dramatists. Freud has created a whole new climate of opinions. For better or worse, he has changed the face of society. Freud's technique of free association, as a method of dream interpretation, has its antecedent in Kabbalistic method of biblical exegesis. Abraham Abulofia developed a method of biblical interpretation that involved the interpreter's meditation upon a free association to the words and letters of the Torah, the ultimate purpose of which was to unseal the soul, to untie the knots which bind it, knots that separate an individual's personal existence from its natural connection with divine life. Many of Sigmund Freud's nauseating theories emanate from his Kabbalistic upbringing, in which his father and mother raised him. This is documented in David Bakken's book, Sigmund Freud and the Jewish Mystical Traditions. Both of Freud's parents came from Galicia, a region whose atmosphere was saturated with Hasidism, a late and socially widespread form of Jewish mysticism. Freud says explicitly in a letter to Robach that his father came from Hasidic milieu, and we know from a paper by Aaron that Tismanitz, the birthplace of Jacob Freud, Freud's father, was filled with Hasidic lore and learning. Aaron also reports a conversation between Freud and Chaim Bloch in which they discussed Kabbalah, Hasidism, and Judaism in general. Aaron remarks what it was that moved Freud to interest himself in Kabbalah and Hasidism is not hard to understand. He must have felt himself to be spiritually at home in these worlds. This could explain Freud's feeling of superiority towards Gentiles. At times he would appear as if this hate sprang from his position as a Jew. His attitude towards the Gentile religion is revealed in a letter to Martha, when she was his fiancée. He discussed his neurothenia and what he should do about it. He decided that he would take life more easily and says, for the rest of my time in the hospital, I will live like the goys, modestly learning the ordinary things without striving after discoveries or reaching to the depths. Apparently he felt superior. But if so, there was no compelling reason to use the term goys, which is a somewhat contemptuous term for Gentiles. At the Second International Psychoanalytical Congress at Nuremberg in 1910, Freud had proposed that Young be made permanent president. A protest meeting was held in a hotel room. Freud appeared on the scene, and he said, Most of you are Jews, and therefore you are incompetent to win friends for the new teaching. Jews must be content with the modest role of preparing the ground. It is absolutely essential that I should form ties in the world of general science. The Swiss will save us, will save me and all of you as well. There is no doubt that Carl Jung was chosen to deflect attention from the fact that psychotherapy was influenced by Freud's Jewish surroundings. As a mystic, Jung recognized the Jewish cultural and Kabbalistic roots of Freud's teachings. For a real understanding of the Jewish component in Freud's outlook, a thorough knowledge would be needed of the specifically Jewish assumptions in regard to history, culture, and religion. Since Freud calls for an extremely serious assessment on all these levels, one would have to take a deep plunge into the history of the Jewish mind. This would carry us beyond Jewish orthodoxy into the subterranean workings of Hasidism, and then into the intricacies of the Kabbalah, which still remains unexplored psychologically. Joseph Bloch, a prominent figure in the events of the day, approached Freud with the idea of writing an introduction to a German translation of a work by Chaim Wittel, the most prominent student and expositor of the Luranic Kabbalah. Samford Drab, a highly esteemed author in Jewish circles, quotes the preface to the 1975 paperback edition of Sigmund Freud and the Jewish Mystical Tradition, and commented on the occasion. According to Bloch, Freud read the manuscript and was beside himself with excitement. 
Freud exclaimed, This is gold, and queried why Vital's work had never before been brought to his attention. In a meeting in Freud's home, Bloch reports that Freud agreed to write the foreword and even volunteered to assist Bloch in getting the manuscript published. The relationship came to an end, however, when Freud showed Bloch a manuscript of Freud's own Moses and Monotheism. Bloch was aghast, stating, Anti-Semites accuse us of killing the founder of Christianity. Now a Jew adds that we also killed the founder of Judaism. Bloch reports that Freud left the room in anger, leaving Bloch in the library. In that library, according to Bloch, was a large collection of Judaica, including a number of books on the Kabbalah in German and French translation of the Zohar. The book Kabbalistic Metaphors brings to light many parallels between Freudian psychoanalysis and the Kabbalah of Isaac Luria. Besides his fascination with the Kabbalah, Freud was a loyal member of the Vienna Bunai Berit Lodge. Only Jews are allowed to be members of this chauvinistic lodge. It is also noteworthy to mention that almost all of his colleagues, with Young as the outstanding exception, were Jews. Participation in the B'nai B'rith Lodge in Vienna was one of the very few recreations that Freud permitted himself. Among his recreations was his weekly game of tarot, a popular card game based on Kabbalah. Young's neo-paganism and his desire to replace Christianity with his own concept of psychoanalysis can be seen in a letter he wrote to Freud. I imagine a far finer and more comprehensive task for psychoanalysis than alliance with an ethical fraternity. I think we must give it time to infiltrate into people from many centers to revivify among intellectuals a feeling for symbol and myth ever so gently to transform Christ back into the soothsaying God of the vine, which he was, and in this way absorb those ecstatic, instinctical forces of Christianity for the one purpose of making the cult and the sacred myth what they once were, a drunken feast of joy where man regained the ethos and holiness of an animal. Freud must have seen in Young, a student who would perpetuate his own disdain and perversion of Christianity. The amazing thing about the psychoanalytic theory is that it is not based on science. It is spawned from a perverted, demented mind. The widely acclaimed Encyclopedia Judica describes Freud's pseudo-scientific theory with a tincture of euphemism. While Freud's theories may easily be faulted for the lack of control in data collection, the failure to check on the validity of their factual basis and the impossibility of deriving testable hypotheses from them, they nevertheless gave rise to a flourishing and viable school of psychology. Beyond the field of psychology, psychoanalytic theory has widely influenced our culture in many ways, particularly in art and literature. Many of Freud's theories are patently ridiculous. In an effort to save psychotherapy, some psychotherapists have jettisoned some of his theories while preserving its Kabbalistic roots. Even Freud himself admits that he is not a man of science, but describes himself as a conquistador, adventurer, and he uses other colorful expressions. I am actually not at all a man of science, not an observer, not an experimenter, not a thinker. I am by temperament nothing but a conquistador, an adventurer, if you want it translated, with all the curiosity, daring, and tenacity characteristic of a man of this sort. We need not go to the synagogue of Satan seeking mental health, but trust in the gospel of Christ, which is the power of God to all who believe. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Here, in his own words, is Freud's explanation for why people become psychiatrists. Do you know why psychiatrists go into their specialty? It is because they do not feel that they are normal, and they go into this work because it is a means of sublimation for this feeling, a means of assuring themselves that they are really normal. Society puts them in charge of the mentally abnormal, and so they feel reassured. 
I believe that Sigmund Freud, the creator of psychotherapy, and his Jewish associates were insane. In the heyday of Freud's popularity, insanity ranked higher among the Jews than any other nation. This blistering statement is documented in the Jewish Encyclopedia 1905 edition. Among the Jews, the proportion of insane has been observed to be very large. From statistics collected by Buskin, he concludes that they are four to six times more liable to mental disease than are non-Jews. In the various provinces of Germany, and also in Denmark, the percentage of Jewish insane is very large, as is seen from the figures in the appended table. In this table, the proportion of Jewish insane is in nearly all places very large, in some cases more than double that of the non-Jewish population. Among the 723 non-Jewish male insane, 173 were found to be affected with alcoholic insanity. Among the 496 female patients, 22. As not one Jew or Jewish was affected with alcoholism, are deducted the relative percentage of Jewish insanity is perceptibly increased. Perhaps Freud was attempting to invent an antidote for the epidemic of insanity among his race. Some might consider it taboo to be quoting from the 1905 Jewish Encyclopedia on Jewish Insanity. So I consulted the voluminous Encyclopedia Judica, published in 1973, to see what current Jewish scholarship has to say regarding Jewish insanity. It did not surprise me that Jewish insanity was no longer open for investigation. In other words, it was not included. I will quote from two prominent Jerusalem psychiatrists who have worked for 20 years in the Community Mental Health Center at Herzog Hospital in Jerusalem. In their 2001 book, Sanity and Sanctity, Mental Health Work Among the Ultra-Orthodox in Jerusalem, the overall conclusion to be drawn from reading this book is that the Jewish mantle of insanity has continued unabated since the concoction of the Talmud and the Kabbalah. Those two eminent Jewish psychiatrists stated that 40% of their patients experience religious experiences before their admissions. The data we have presented do not permit us to draw conclusions about whether and how Jerusalem's religious ambience induces psychiatric disturbance. Nevertheless, over a quarter of the sample were attracted to Jerusalem for overtly mystical religious motives and 40% had had mystical religious experiences before their admission. After studying the insane teachings of the Talmud and the Kabbalah, I believe that those who follow these venomous volumes are at high risk of being insane. Christ's words describe what happens to people who seek aid through the nebulous teachings of psychotherapy. They be blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Sigmund Freud laid the foundation for psychotherapy and paved it with Kabbalah. Not only is he considered the father of psychotherapy, but his ideas also permeate latter-day theories and therapies. I leave you with a quote from an article entitled The Jewish Century in the Weekend Post. This quote serves to illustrate the indelible mark Sigmund Freud has left upon millions of people. Psychiatrists and therapists throughout the world who use Freudian ideas in their treatments are now numbered in the millions. At a more popular level, Freud has influenced the world by his impact on artists of all kinds, writers especially, but also painters and composers. Freud may have been a bad scientist, but he was certainly a stylist and neologist of genius. Many of his terms have passed into all languages, the Oedipus complex, inferiority complex, infantile sexuality, guilt complex, transference, sublimation, the ego, the id, and the superego, plus such phrases foisted on him as the death wish and the Freudian slip. He became to a greater extent than any other writer-thinker of modern times the provider of smart new mental furniture for the 20th century intellect. The effect on human behavior in the 20th century, therefore, has been inestimable. Christ is able to cure all maladies, but only if the world would trust him. 
The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Shall a man make gods unto himself, and they are no gods? Because all substance is thus ultimately an overflowing of God's substance, Kabbalah is a pantheistic doctrine. To the trained pantheist, the abstraction is the ever-to-be-unknown deity. Notwithstanding the strongly pantheistic coloring of its metaphysics, the Kabbalah never attempted to belittle the importance of historic Judaism. The author of the Zohar proper, as we shall have occasion to see, inclines towards pantheism. This might come as a shock to many people. Monotheistic Judaism, when it evolves into mysticism, becomes pantheistic. The pantheism of the Kabbalah is cleverly hidden. Like searching for a chameleon, you have to look carefully to see it. A highly esteemed and widely quoted scholar, considered an authority on the Kabbalah, gives the following example. Apparent theistic tendencies can serve to conceal actually pantheistic views. Examples of this are Azrael's pronouncement that nothing is outside, Einsof, Mir Ibn Gabai declaration that everything is in him and he is in everything, or the recurring insistence in the Zohar that God is everything and that everything is unified in him, as is known to the mystics. Strictly speaking, however, the problem of pantheism does occur in connection with a number of specific questions that greatly preoccupied Kabbalistic speculation, and to which pantheistic doctrines were at least able to offer unambiguous answers. The Kabbalist response to creation is never theistic. It depends on an emanationist approach. The theology of macro and microcosm made it complex. Sundry intermediaries and the ten sephirot multiplied the pantheistic tendencies. Abandoning an unacceptable theistic doctrine is a step towards a pantheistic position. If pantheism requires a creation doctrine, some type of emanationism seems most plausible. The heterogeneous elements of this Talmudic mysticism are as yet unfused. The Platonic Alexandrian, Oriental Theosophic, and Judeo-allegorical ingredients being still easily recognizable and not yet elaborated into the system of the Kabbalah. Jewish monotheism was still transcendentalism, but as mysticism attempted to solve the problems of creation and world government by introducing sundry intermediary personages, creative potentialities such as Metatron, Shekinah, and so on, the more necessary it became to exalt God in order to prevent his reduction to a mere shadow, this exaltation being rendered possible by the introduction of the pantheistic doctrine of emanation, which taught that in reality nothing existed outside of God. 
The visions which these mystics beheld in their ecstasies were considered as real, giving rise within the pale of Judaism to an anthropomorphic mysticism which took its place beside that of the pantheists. Daniel Matt is a professor at the Center for Jewish Studies at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, California. He received his Ph.D. from Brandeis University and has taught at Stanford University and the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. In his book, God and the Big Bang, he quoted the 16th century Kabbalist Moses Cordovero's pantheistic views. Moses Cordovero was a well-known mystic of the 16th century, and his influence continues today. By calling God Einsof, Jewish mystics imply that everything is divine. The Kabbalist, Moses Cordovero, writing in the 16th century, put it this way, The essence of divinity is found in every single thing. Nothing but it exists. Since it causes everything to be, no thing can live by anything else. It enlivens them. Einsof exists in each existent. Do not say, this is a stone and not God. God forbid. Rather, all existence is God, and the stone is a thing pervaded by divinity. New Age guru and sage Deepak Chopra mentioned the connection between the Kabbalah and Hinduism in the New York magazine. He admits that it's so craftily put together that most Jews would not recognize it. Here he is pictured with his close friend Rabbi Shmuley Botiak, the New Age Kabbalist. This year, Deepak Chopra will conduct workshops in Israel. Chopra told me, most Jews don't know it, he said, but the parallels between the Kabbalah and Hinduism are amazing. He ran through a list of Hebrew words and religious concepts that sounded very much like their Sanskrit counterparts. A Max Kopper professor of Jewish thought at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem confirms the previous appellations of Chopra. One cannot underrate the possibility that Hindu traditions infiltrated into Kabbalah, perhaps via the intermediacy of Sufi material, a fact that may be a clue to the penetration of an alien mystical technique into a Jewish milieu. Now, there is a text within uh, Judaism, the Chumash, known as the Bible, where we are told that Abraham sends his sons, through his wife Hagar, to the lands of the east, La'aretse Kedem. Now, we understand the lands of the east to refer to India, Hodu. The text goes on and says that he gave his sons gifts, presents, matanot. And these gifts and presents are understood to be spiritual insights of high order. And it's presumably they did go, the sons, to the lands of the east. And we find within the Indian tradition, for example, there is a, a historical tradition whereby a fair-skinned people came from the other side and introduced some of the earlier wisdoms into what became part of the eastern religions. In fact, if you look into the Indian tradition, they actually named a river after um, the Abraham who sent his sons. That river's name is Indus, the Indus River, and in Indian, Indus means the other side. So it's a very interesting little uh, point of conjecture how it got there by name. Furthermore, we're told that they adopted Abraham's name as a name for one of the deities, Brahman. The word Brahman is a reassociation of letters of Abraham. Furthermore, one of the sons of Abraham is referred to in the Chumash, in the Bible, as Ashurim. Ashurim introduced the ashrams. The Veda poetry, for example, is related to the Hebrew word Yadea, knowledge, insight. Then we have another term, Prana which abounds in one of these traditions, which relates to the Hebrew word pe'er, an elevated point of beauty. We also have the Indian word ram, which means exactly the same what the word ram means in Hebrew, elevated, high. 
You can go even further and talk about the Indian word for spiritual impurity, which is tamas, which in Hebrew is tamer. So it's absolutely fascinating to see how even at the level of terminology, we have uh, a very clear association between what we call our Jewish mystical tradition, stemming from Kabbalah, which I'll explain shortly, and some of these other traditions. And perhaps even more fascinating is at the conceptual level, where the concepts within, for example, Buddhism, one finds very clearly enunciated within Judaism, within the Kabbalistic tradition. So we certainly do find a number of very strong parallels between the Jewish mystical tradition Kabbalah and a lot of the Eastern traditions. When we examine Hinduism with its many deities, we Westerners would be tempted to ask how could they keep track with all those deities? Any good authority on Hinduism and the occult will explain that all these different deities reveal different attributes to the unmanifest deity, which they call Brahma Neutra. Brahma Neutra is the spirit that receives reverence when the Hindus worship these myriads of deities. He is called the unmanifest, yet still he is manifest through all these different gods. This is called inclusive or multi-level pantheism. Such is the simple and natural explanation of the 33 crores gods in India. These gods were begotten and endowed with being as a result of the blind endeavor to personify that which cannot be personified, thus giving rise to idols. In the course of time, the cornerstone of the philosophic and religious world conception of their wise men found itself in the hands of the ambitious, coldly calculating Brahmanism, who broke the stone into chips and ground it into the dust for the convenient assimilation by the masses. But for the thinker, as well as for every unprejudiced Orientalist, these mishappen chips, as well as their finely crushed gravel, are nonetheless, from the very same stone, attributes of the manifested energy of Parabrahman, the one that forever is, without beginning or end. The Davi Upanishad continues, She is all the gods, those worshipped in our religion, and those worshipped in other religions. She manifests as the divine beings, and as the demonic beings. Therefore worship me in whatever form appeals to you, and I promise, in that very form I will come to you. This is the reason you can travel from the Mother's Temple in Kamakaya at the northern edge of India to her shrine at Kanyakumari at the southernmost tip of the subcontinent without one Hindu trying to convert you. In India, they say, there is only one goddess, therefore all other gods are real. Hindu texts claim there are thirty-three million gods and that there is only one divine being, all deities are different faces of that one inconceivable being. Hindu philosophers and theologians began to systemize ideas that had not been fully worked out in the Upanishads. In the late 8th and early 9th century CE, a talented philosopher named Shankara would become the most celebrated exponent of the position which eventually became known as Advaita Vedanta. Advaita literally means not to. Advaita Vedanta therefore claims that the ultimate Brahman and the individual self or Atman are one and the same. Shankara said that the gods are lower forms of the one Brahman. He said people do not harm themselves by worshipping a personal god. Shankara himself was a devotee of the god Shiva, but Shankara believed that eventually each person must go beyond dependence on individual deities. He said that each of us will realize that all distinct gods are imperfect reflections of what he called the Brahman without qualities. A universally accepted authority on Freemasonry documents this pantheistic monotheism. The spirit of the Vedas, as understood by their earliest as well as most recent expositors, is decidedly a pantheistic monotheism, one God, and he all in all, 
the many divinities, numerous as the prayers addressed to them, being resolvable into the titles and attributes of a few, and ultimately into the one. Knowledgeable witches like Anne Mora would not deny that the sources that I quoted are impeccable. She points out the inclusive pantheistic monotheism in the androgynous deities of Shiva and Shakti. Of the two sides of deity, it was the female that received many different names to express her various attributes, but the male retained his name and had the attributes listed afterwards. I generally refer to the primary deities of the Indus as Shiva and Shakti, or Shiva and Uma Parvati, but over the millennia the aspects and descriptives of both deities, particularly those of the goddess, have come to be proper names. This does not reflect a multitude of goddesses or gods, but one goddess and one god, conjoined and approachable in different names, depicting ways for different purposes, under different names depicting various aspects. The duality of the god and the goddess is monotheistic approach that recognizes the inherent oneness in nature resulting from a natural twosome. A whole has two halves, yet remains a whole, and the whole may be divided into numerous segments, yet remains a whole. Shiva and Shakti are independent. As Ardhanari, they are one. The secret doctrine of the priests of Chaldea is identical to what we just read. The ancient thinkers, priests, who framed the vague guesses of the groping, dreaming mind into schemes and systems of profound meaning, expressed this sense of the twofold nature of things by worshipping a double divine being or principle, masculine and feminine. Thus, every god was supplied with a wife through the entire series of divine emanations and manifestations. And as all the gods were in reality only different names and forms of the supreme and unfathomable one, so all the goddesses represent only Belit, the great feminine principle of nature, productiveness, maternity, tenderness, also contained, like everything else, in that one, and emanating from it in endless succession. Hence it come that the goddesses of the Chaldeo Babylonian religion, though different in name and apparently in attributions, become wonderfully alike when looked at closer. They are all more or less repetitions of Belit, the wife of Bel. Her name, which is only the feminine form of the god's meaning, the lady, as Bel means the Lord, sufficiently shows that the two are really one. A hundred years ago, Wallace Budge was keeper of Egyptian and Assyrian antiquities at the British Museum. In his book, Amulets and Talismans, he stated that the Egyptians and the Pythagoreans revered the number one as sacred to deity. The number one represented God. The Egyptian declared in his hymns to Ra that he was the one. The Pythagoreans made one equal the deity indivisible and embracing all things. We previously stated that the Muslim god Allah was and still is the chief deity in the shrine in Mecca. The Quran of today has been altered to hide the apparent pagan expressions attributed to Allah. However, there is enough material in the widely read translation of Yusuf Ali to show that Islam did not escape its polytheistic and pantheistic expressions of deity by its predecessors. To God belong the East and the West. Whithersoever ye turn, there is the face of God, for God is all-pervading, all-knowing. It was we who created man, and we know what dark suggestions his soul makes to him, for we are nearer to him than his jugular vein. Is it ye who create it, or are we the creators? We learn from the preceding quote that Allah is all-pervading, which means that he is in everything. This is inverted pantheism at its best. Then we see that sometimes he is mentioned in a polytheistic manner. There is a reason for this. Muhammad was confused. Having been brought up in a pagan environment, he was trying to separate Allah from his polytheistic surroundings, and so he refashioned him to be the monotheistic god of the Bible. 
Allah was and still is the head of the Arabian pantheon. Similarly, the god El is the head of the Phoenician pantheon. El is the first of the major gods and the head of the pantheon. In the epithets that are applied to him, he is seen as the father of the gods and human beings and as the creator of heaven and earth. The totality of the gods constitutes his family and he presides over the assembly of the gods. Ultimate pantheism is a creation of Satan to make us believe that all religions lead to the same God. CNN founder Ted Turner in the magazine Hinduism Today promulgates this religious pluralism. There are so many different languages, so many different forms of music, and so much different dance, so many different cultures, but basically we are all the same. So I thought, maybe instead of all these different gods, Maybe there's one God who manifests himself and revealed himself in different ways, different people. What about that, huh? All right. This was stated at the United Nations Unprecedented Babylonian Gathering held from August 28th to September 1st, 2000. The agenda was to promote a universal pantheistic agreement, one that considered all religions as being true. Christ's words, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, are viewed as arrogance or even worse, religious intolerance. Ask about the issue of proselytization, which came up repeatedly, and he, Bawa Jain, said, I think the message is to be that each religion needs to reach out to its adherents and ask them to become more faithful to their own tradition. It is not a matter of seeking to convert people from other religions. I think that is sometimes the cause of a lot of conflict and a lot of aggravation. I really think the Christian leaders will have to sit down with the other leaders and come up with how not to engage in active proselytization and rather create an awareness of more respect and understanding for each religion. Here is a picture of Madame Blavatsky with her ascended masters. The occultists believe that the term ascended masters refers to those souls who, after many incarnations and life experiences, have mastered the lessons of the physical realm. They then choose whether to serve on planet Earth or to channel from other realms and dimensions. If Blavatsky was alive today, she would have echoed something similar to what was stated at the United Nations Conference. Better to believe at least in one of the qualities of divinity, personifying and worshipping it under that particular guise, which represents to each one, according to the power of his understanding, the most convenient semblance and symbol of the all, than to deny the all. The secret strength of the Kabbalah lies within the chameleon-like pantheism that appears monotheistic to the brainwash and pantheistic to those who are able to discern the truth. Here are a few more quotes from gurus of Kabbalistic scholarship to demonstrate that this is not mere speculation concerning this important point. The path of imminence only rarely occurred in Theosophical Kabbalah. Pantheistic views are indeed presented in the works of Rabbi Moses de Leon, Rabbi Joseph of Hamadan, Rabbi Joseph ben Shalom, Asha Kenazi, and later on Rabbi Moses Cordovero. But even these Kabbalists would unequivocally acknowledge the existence of a transcendent layer of divine. For these, and for similar authors, the pantheistic or panentheistic ideas were the ultimate consequences of their emanational systems. Extreme, substantialist interpretation of emanation could, and actually did, lead to a variety of pantheistic views. Apparent theistic tendencies can serve to conceal actually pantheistic views. Examples of this are Azrael's pronouncement that nothing is outside, Einsof, Mir ibn Gabai, declaration that everything is in him and he is in everything, or the recurring insistence in the Zohar that God is everything and that everything is unified in him, as is known to the mystics. Such formulations in the Zohar became extremely popular among later Kabbalists and in the writing of Hasidism, where they were used to bridge theistic and pantheistic opinions abounding in these texts.
But if you say that the Holy One, blessed be He, exalts Himself in the world only for Israel, this is certainly so. They, the Pharisees, held that only Israelites are men. Gentiles they classed not as men, but as barbarians. Rabbi Zalman Shmokin said right off that Judaism's restoration did not lie with the Gentiles. He cited a passage in the Mishnah, Ethics of Our Fathers, a favorite of the Rebbe Schneerson, Love the creatures, and bring them closer to the Torah. Once you get over the idea that Goem are referred to as creatures, it's a compelling notion. Israelites were stamped with that sign of holiness and purity, for just as the supernal holy beings are marked in such a way as to distinguish between the holy region and the impure unholy region, so the Israelites are marked in order to distinguish between the holy people and the idolatrous nations who are derived from the impure unholy regions. Anyone who investigates the Zohar and the writings of some prominent rabbis will come to the conclusion that the Zohar inherently promotes racism. In the Zohar, many times non-Jews or Gentiles are referred to as impure. For during his lifetime, he is impure on all sides. His shadow is impure, and his spirit is impure. Since impurities lie within him, it is forbidden to come near him though their bodies are defiled both during their life and in their deaths yet when alive all the impurities within them have the power to defile others according to the zohar if a jew took a gentile woman to be his wife the offspring of them would be unclean this was the answer rabbi shimon gave to rabbi yossi concerning his question about an israelite marrying a gentile woman they are unclean while they live because their souls are drawn from the side of defilement for that reason he who cleaves to a woman from the heathen nations is defiled and the child that she bears him receives the spirit of defilement you may ask is it not of israel from the side of its father if so why should it receive the spirit of defilement come and behold First its father was besmirched when he united with that tainted woman. All the more so, the child that she bears will receive the spirit of defilement upon it. Furthermore, he also transgressed the Torah. In the English translation of the Zohar, the translators avoid using the word Gentile in the negative, but replace it with words that they can manipulate in case they are charged as being racist. They use words like idolatrous nations, impure, heathens, children of the serpent, children of Cain. Rabbi Shnur Zalman of Leadi, the founder of today Habad Lubavitch Hasidic movement, quotes the Kabbalah extensively in his writings of the Tanya. His following diatribe towards Gentiles and his elevation of Jews is an indelible mark of his work. The souls of the world, however, emanate from the other unclean kellypot, which contain no good whatever. Therefore, also the evil impulse and the force that strains after forbidden things is a demon of non-Jewish demons, which is the evil impulse of the nations, whose souls are derived from the three unclean kellypot. The soul of a Jew is truly a part of God above. Gentile souls are of a completely different and inferior order. They are totally evil, with no redeeming qualities whatsoever. Consequently, references to Gentiles in Rabbi Schnur Zalman's teachings are invariably invidious. In general terms, they were created only to test, to punish, to elevate, and ultimately to serve Israel. All Jews were innately good all Gentiles innately evil. Jews were the pinnacle of creation and served the Creator, Gentiles its nadir and worshipped the heavenly hosts. As servants provide physical sustenance for their masters, the Gentile nations were intended to provide physical sustenance for Israel. The world was only created for the sake of Israel. They maintain all nations meaning they exist due to Israel's sake. The now-deceased Israel Shahak 
was chairperson of the Israeli League for Human and Civil Rights. He was familiar with the writings of the unedited Kabbalah. Disgusted with what he saw, he warned the world of how the traditional Kabbalists view non-Jews. They believe that Satan, as described in the Kabbalah, is rational and well-versed in logic. They believe further that the power of Satan and of his earthly manifestation, the non-Jews, can at times only be broken by irrational action. The role of Satan, whose earthly embodiment according to the Kabbalah is every non-Jew, has been minimized or not mentioned by authors who have not written about Kabbalah in Hebrew. Such authors, therefore, have not conveyed to the readers accurate accounts. Rabbi Abba said that living soul designates Israel because they are children to the Almighty, and their souls, which are holy, come from Him. From whence, then, come the souls of other peoples? Rabbi Eliezer said, They obtain souls from those sides of the left which convey impurity, and therefore they are all impure and defile those who have contact with them. Rabbi Eliezer said, the repetition of the words after its kind confirms what we have said before, that living soul refers to Israel, who have holy living souls from above, and cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth, to the other peoples who are not living soul, but who are, as we have said. Caesar Aharon, a fearless Jewish expositor of Jewish law, became a Christian in 1998. Before his conversion, he was raised in the Jewish religion. He exposes us to many of the extreme kosher laws, which are normally not translated into English. One of these laws is concerning the rights of a Jew towards a Gentile woman. One of the most extreme enactments related to the Gilui Ariot made by the rabbis is the one found in the Mishnah Torah, the Laws of Forbidden Sexual Relations, Chapter 12, Rule 8, says, A Jew who has sex with a Gentile woman, whether she be a child of three years and one day, or an adult, whether single or married, and even if he, the Jew, is a minor of nine years and one day, because he had willful sexual contact with her, she must be killed, for a Jew came to a disaster through her, just as if, he had been with a beast. In the English translation of the Zohar, you will not find direct statements against Christ and Christianity, not because the Kabbalists had nothing bad to say about Christianity, but because it was not translated into English. Two respected Jewish historians extracted the following from the Zohar. The Zohar identifies all blasphemers and wicked people with the evil principles of shells, the first serpent, Cain, Esau, Pharaoh, then also Esau's empire, Rome, and Christendom. From the side of idolatry, Shabbatat is called Lilith, mixed dung, on account of the filth mixed from all other kinds of dirt and worms, into which they throw dead dogs and dead asses, the sons of Esau and Ishmael, and their Jesus, who are dead dogs, abomination and bad smell soiled and fetid a bad family talking about murder according to jewish law it is a religious duty to eliminate jewish apostates jews who believe in jesus and other enemies of the jewish people as caesar aharon translated from the mishnah torah laws of idolatry chapter 10 rules 1 and 2 we may not draw a covenant with the idol worshippers which will establish peace between them and yet allow them to worship idols for it is written do not establish a covenant with them rather they must renounce the religious convictions or be killed it is forbidden to have mercy upon them for it is written do not be gracious to them therefore if we see any of them who is being swept away or drowning in a river we should not help him if we see him at the verge of death, we should not save him. But it is forbidden to eliminate him by hand, or to push him into a pit, or the like, provided that he is not waging war against us. To whom these rules apply? To the Goy. But Jewish traitors, the Minim, and the Epicurism, 
we are commanded to kill them with our own hands and to cause them to descend to the pit of destruction for they are a snare to the jews and sway the people away from god as it was done to jesus the nazarene and his disciples and to tzadok and Betos with their disciples may the name of the wicked become putrid michael higger was a u.s talmudic scholar who devoted his life to the study of jewish sources and their publications in this rare 1932 text he presents the reconstruction of the ideal rabbinic society in the messianic era the gentile nations will be subdued and have to be instructed by torah scholars during the time that the tree of life dominates the tree of knowledge of good and evil is subdued the common people will not have anything except for what the torah scholars will hand out to them and they common people will become subdued like never before they are the children of lilith who is a woman in menstruation a maidservant a gentile woman and a prostitute and they return to their roots about them it is written for out of the serpent's root shall come forth a viper jews who resist these appointed torah scholars will be killed it is mentioned by those who are ignorant of torah yet are of the good side and they stood at the foot of the mountain so will they be at the last redemption under torah scholars like a slave that follows along the horse's footsteps of his lord just as it was called out to them at the foot of the mountain if you accept the torah it is better but if not there will be your burial place so he will tell them at the last redemption if you will accept upon yourselves a torah scholar during the redemption from the exile like a horse rider with his attendant servant it is best and if not therein exile shall be your burial it is clear from the rabbi's point of view what will happen to the people who resist this kabbalistic talmudic world order the wicked are to be eliminated from the scene merely because the destiny of humanity is to be guided and controlled by a new army the army of the righteous a change of power will have to take place whereby the righteous will assume the responsibilities of the new state of the affairs of mankind in general the peoples of the world will be divided into two main groups the israelitic and the non-israelitic the former will be righteous these nations will not exist in the ideal era and their rule will be abolished before the advent of the messianic age allied with these unrighteous nations are those peoples who possess the wicked traits of the traditional amalekites ishmaelites and gibbonites before the dawn of the new era their end will come but withal redemption will not be complete until amalek will be exterminated for against amalek the oath was taken that the lord will have war against amalek from generation to generation when these shall be exterminated it will be as if god had made heaven and earth on that day hence it is written on the day that god makes heaven and earth at that time god will reveal himself with the shekinah and the world will be renewed as it is written for as the new earth and the new heaven at that time the lord shall cause to spring from the ground every pleasant tree but before these are exterminated the rain of the torah will not descend and israel who are compared to herbs and trees cannot shoot up further there is a law concerning the slaughter of foreigners who are the same as beasts this slaughter is to be carried out in a lawfully valid manner the ones who do not follow the jewish religious law have to be offered to god as a sacrifice it is to them that psalm forty four twenty two refers yea for thy sake are we killed all the day long we are counted as sheep for the slaughter the seventh lubavitcher rebbe rabbi manikin mendel Sneerson, was perhaps the twentieth century's best-known orthodox jewish leader Former U.S. President Jimmy Carter proclaimed April 18, 1978, Rabbi Snearson's birthday as Education Day USA. Since this proclamation, all succeeding presidents each year honor a racist rabbi who spent his life teaching Jews to further the plans for a theocratic world order spearheaded by Jewish law. The rabbis must have a good laugh, seeing that on Education Day, most Americans are ignorant of their plans. The amount of money that American taxpayers pay to the Israeli government is astonishing, 
Grace Halsall quoted Richard Curtis, a retired career foreign service officer and editor of the Washington Report on Middle East Affairs, documents America's financial support of this Israeli juggernaut. We U.S. taxpayers give the small state of Israel more than $6 billion in foreign and military aid a year. This is in addition to hundreds of millions of taxpayer dollars going to Israel from other parts of the federal budget. Over the past 46 years, from 1949 to 1995, U.S. taxpayers have given $62.2 billion in foreign aid to Israel. This means we've given one of the world's smallest countries with a population less than that of Hong Kong as much aid money as we've given all of the countries of sub saharan Africa and Latin America and the Caribbean combined. The total aid to those countries amounted to $40 per person, while the aid to Israel amounted to 10775 per person. That aid is official foreign aid. Then, outside that budget, there is a large amount of additional U.S. taxpayer assistance that flows to Israel. This additional money does not appear either on the U.S. aid or U.S. foreign assistance charts. Grants to Israel are tucked into the budgets of many U.S. agencies, ranging from the Department of Commerce to the U.S. Information Agency, with the largest chunks appearing in the Pentagon budget. If you add these additional grants, we taxpayers have given more than $83 billion to Israel, which comes out to more than 14000 annually per present-day Israeli. Besides all the money Israel receives from American taxpayers, we have the Christian Coalition and numerous other Christian organizations providing enormous support for Israel. Through ignorance of the Jewish religion and Bible prophecy, Christian Zionism is the most effective weapon in the Israeli arsenal to silence critics of the nefarious Talmudic Kabbalistic agenda. The following is a quote from a popular TV evangelist writing about why he became a Christian Zionist. In June of 1978, I went to Israel as a tourist and came home a Zionist. I have traveled the world, but as I walked the cobblestone streets of the holy city, I knew I was home. My roots were there. I felt a very special presence in that sacred city that changed my life forever. As I stood praying at the western wall, I noticed an elderly Orthodox Jewish man praying with all his might, rocking back and forth, reciting scripture and thought to myself, Here we are, at the same holy place, praying to the same God, quoting the same scripture, yet I know nothing about this man or his faith. My question to John Hagee is, how can you be certain that you are praying to the same God while you are oblivious to this man's life and his feet? What John Hagee and many Christian Zionists fail to realize is that for many Jews, the scriptures is understood through the reading of the Talmud and the Kabbalah. My son, be more careful in the observance of the words of the scribes than in the words of the Torah. The Zohar appeals to many Jews in a way that makes them regard it as the most sacred of sacred books, for it mirrors Judaism as an intensely vital religion of the spirit, more overpoweringly than any other book or code, more even than the Bible, does it give to the Jew the conviction of an inner, unseen, spiritual universe, an eternal moral order. Many Christian Zionists are what Christ calls wolves in sheep's clothing. They go to church, theological school, and preach in the pulpit, but when it comes to Bible prophecy, they think like Pharisees. With the dawn of the 21st century, fresh winds of the Spirit are blowing in the church causing Christians to examine the roots of their faith and to recognize these roots as Jewish. The king they worship is the king of the Jews. The God they serve is the God of Israel. Only when one has begun to understand the rabbinic way of thinking can you be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It pays to be a Christian Zionist. In a full-page ad in the June 11, 2002 Washington Post, Stand for Israel stated, For decades Jews have viewed Christians with a mixture of suspicion and fear. Some have even accused them of being intolerant or dangerous. 
But the crisis facing Israel has demonstrated yet again the simple truth that evangelical Christians are among the strongest supporters of Israel in the world today. A recent study by the Pew Research Center found that 62% of religious conservatives are pro-Israel compared to only 26% of secular Democrats. Let me introduce you to some of the views of these ministers of darkness. Jewish extremists would like to see the Palestinians expelled from their land and shipped to Arab countries. Recently in Washington, numerous evangelical Christians were voicing support for the expulsion of Arabs from Palestine. Thousands of evangelical Christians waving Israeli flags cheered last week as Knesset member Benny Ellen called for the relocation of Palestinians from the West Bank into Jordan. Elon, whose Moledet party advocates the transfer of Palestinians to Arab countries, said that a resettlement of the Palestinians is prescribed by the Bible. Elon, an Orthodox rabbi, let's turn to the Bible, which says very clearly we have to resettle them, to relocate them, and to have a Jewish state between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean. Dismissing the legitimacy of the Palestinians' claim to the land, and particularly to Jerusalem, Robertson said that the Palestinians are really Arabs, who moved there a few decades ago. Their claim to that land really does not go back very far such as it is, while the claim of the Jews goes back thousands of years. The Temple Mount, he concluded, belongs to Israel, not to the Palestinians. Founder and former Christian Coalition President Pat Robertson called for the holy city of Jerusalem to be the eternal capital of Israel, stating, Palestine has been occupied by Yasser Arafat and his thugs. We cannot turn it over to him. I don't care if it offends Arabs or not. We must do what is right. House Majority Whip Tom DeLay echoed Robertson's opinion and said that on his recent trip to Israel, I did not see any occupied territory. What I saw was Israel. As long as I am in Congress, DeLay said, I will use every tool at my disposal to make sure America stands with Israel. You can write that in stone. The Christian fundamentalists believe the only Israelis who are really listening to God are the hardline Jewish settlers who live on the West Bank and Gaza and refuse to move. The Christians trudge up to these settlements as if they were making pilgrimages to holy shrines. That's because they and the settlers share a core conviction. You believe that God gave the land of Israel to the Jewish people. I believe it as much as I believe I'm sitting here looking at you right now. It is theirs. It is theirs. Every grain of sand between the Dead Sea the Jordan River and the, and the Mediterranean Sea belongs to the Jew. That includes the West Bank. That includes every It includes of, Gaza. Every bit of it. Every bit of it. And the three million Palestinians who live on the West Bank and Gaza? McAteer suggests the bulk of them could be cleansed from this God-given real estate and moved to some Arab country. Nothing can come between the Jews and their land. In fact, many fundamentalists believe that when Prime Minister Rabin signed the Oslo Accords and offered to trade land for peace, it was not only a mistake, it was a sin. They were going against the word of God. You cannot go against the word of God. And I believe that God stopped it. By? Well, by the things that happened. By the assassination of Prime Minister Rabin? If God, if God wounds and he heals, if he kills and if he makes alive, if he is the Lord and he does these things, then no person dies accidentally. You think Rabin was being punished for getting involved in the peace process? I think that God did not want that Oslo Accord to go through. God save us from these people. Political analyst Jesse Alfer served 12 years in Israel's intelligence agency, the Mossad. Later, he became Israel director of the American Jewish Committee. When you see what these people are encouraging Israel and the U.S. administration to do 
That is, ignore the Palestinians, if not worse, if not kick them out, expand the settlements to the greatest extent possible. Uh, they are leading us into a scenario of out-and-out -out disaster. Televangelist John Hagee's interview with a BBC reporter shows why the Israeli government makes it a priority to meet with Christian Zionists. In your office and in the library beyond, there are several pictures of you in Israel or here greeting Israeli prime ministers from the past and, of course, the present prime minister of Israel. Tell me, how close are your contacts with the Israeli government? Well, if I phone Israel, I could get in contact with most anyone that I wanted to talk to right away. Let me ask you this. Why do you think Israel prime ministers regard you as such an important figure? Well, one, I have been very faithful to support Israel for 20 years. Secondly, I am seen by a potential viewing audience of over 90 million people in America and Canada. I'm on four television networks and 125 full-power TV stations, in addition to 115 radio stations. I'm also, by satellite, over much of Europe, so third-world nations see me. And after being on television twice a day for 24 years, there is an enormous nucleus of American and Canadian people who listen to us on a regular basis. That's why. The previous quote tells us that the Israeli government is not interested in knowing Jesus, but using Christian Zionists like John Hagee to spread their propaganda. Christ commanded us to preach the gospel to all nations. Christian Zionists like John Hagee Ministries do not attempt to target Jews for evangelism. He leaves it up to them to ask him. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things, whatsoever I have commanded you. There's not going to be a conversion of the Jewish people ever until the Messiah gets here. And conversion before the coming of the Messiah is not on your agenda? If a Jewish person asks me about what it requires to be a Christian, I'm delighted to tell them but I do not target Jewish people for salvation. It is my view that a healthy relationship between believing Jews and Christians cannot be achieved by demanding theological changes or revisions. We must accept each other as we are. We must candidly remain what we are. Christians would do well to investigate the origins of the names of Jacob and Israel instead of following Jewish fables. Not paying attention to Jewish myths and commandments of men who turn away from the truth. In popular etymology, the word Jacob means taking hold of the heel, supplanter, layers of snares. This name was given to Jacob to identify him with his previous life before devoting himself to Yahweh. Two incidents recorded in the Bible despite him taking advantage of his brother Esau's hunger and buying his inheritance. When his father Isaac in his old age was blind, Jacob pretended to be Esau to obtain his father's blessing. After this, Jacob fled for his life, fearing Esau's wrath, and ended up in a cave where his life was changed. God renamed him Israel because he accepted God's power to overcome his wicked nature, guilty conscience, and the fear of his brother. The Talmud and Kabbalah of present-day Israel is full of deception and snares the essence of Jacob's life before God changed his name to Israel. The New Testament does not sanction the racist state of Israel, but in fact condemns it. The followers of Christ are the true Israelites, like Jacob, have kept the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many walk according to this rule, peace be on them, and mercy, and upon the Israel of God. We hope you have found this series informative and enlightening. 
If you would like to support this ministry, donations are welcome and may be sent to the address shown at the end of this video. Please specify for the producers of Secrets of Kabbalah.